Good evening, everyone. I am Kate Ford, and at 6.39 p.m., we have concluded closed session, and I'm calling to order this regular meeting of the Santa Barbara Unified School District School Board. And so now for information about interpretation. Thank you, Board President Ford. Good afternoon. I will give this interpreting announcement in both English and Spanish. Muy buenas noches. Voy a dar este anuncio sobre la interpretación en inglés y en español. In order to provide language access, we will be providing simultaneous bi-directional interpretation in English and Spanish. If you are bilingual, you do not have to click anything. If you are not bilingual in English and Spanish, you will have to select your language in order to hear the interpretation. If you are on a laptop or desktop, at the bottom right of your screen, you will see a globe icon that says interpretation. Please click on the globe icon now and select English. If you are on an iPad or a phone, locate the three dot menu and select language interpretation, then select English and click done. When it's your turn to speak, please remember to be loud and clear. And with regards to American Sign Language interpretation, we are offering American Sign Language ASL interpretation for this meeting. If you will be using ASL interpretation, please use the Zoom app on your computer, tablet, or phone to join this meeting. If you joined this meeting through your web browser, you may not be able to see the ASL interpreter at all times. Buenas noches. Esta reunión contará con interpretación simultánea bidireccional en inglés y en español. Si usted es bilingüe, no tiene que presionar nada. Si usted no es bilingüe, tendrá que elegir su idioma para escuchar la interpretación. Si está usando una computadora, verá un icono en la parte inferior de su pantalla a la derecha en forma de globo que dice interpretación. Haga clic ahí ahora y seleccione español. Si está usando un iPad o su teléfono, localice el menú de tres puntos, haga clic en interpretación de idiomas, elija español y aceptar. O si está en inglés, dice done. Cuando sea su turno de hablar, por favor recuerde hablar con voz fuerte y clara. Y también un recuerdo sobre la interpretación del lenguaje de señas americano. Estamos ofreciendo interpretación del lenguaje de señas americano, ASL, para esta reunión. Si usted utilizará los servicios de interpretación del lenguaje de señas americano, por favor utilice la aplicación de Zoom en su computadora, tableta o teléfono para poder ingresar a esta reunión. Si usted ingresó a esta reunión usando su navegador web, es posible que no pueda ver al intérprete del lenguaje de señas en todo momento. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. And continuing at this time, I'd like to ask Superintendent Maldonado to please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Buenas noches a todos. Please put your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now, Superintendent Maldonado, could you please continue with your report? Thank you. Yes, and I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Barnwell, I believe, or Mr. Rouse to show our slides. Um, and to begin with, uh, board members, I do want to just uh, highlight a few things that we've uh, worked on this week and uh, a little bit of last week. On Tuesday, January 9th and Monday, January 25th, we hosted two college and career readiness workshops in Espanol. We saw an attendance of over 100 participants each evening and the participants showed up with lots of eagerness to learn. The success of this night was thanks to the collaboration of our Mrs. Maria Larios Horton, our family engagement uh, unit, Tiffany Carson, um, uh, Edith, Edith Cortez from our peak and avid counselor from Santa Barbara High School, who exuded such welcoming presence for our families. Many of the topics we touched on was the importance of the role of parents, guardians play in helping their students discover their interests, the many programs and academies offered at our high schools to help students become college and career ready and college and career competitive. The next steps will be for families to take on their college and career path. We also had a special guest spot for Cuca Acosta from UCSB who also enthusiastically discussed the supports for incoming students and their families offered at the university. Both nights ended with lots of questions and great answers. 
that further showed us the value of these types of family engagements that really reach families where they're at and in a way, in a language and in a cultural way that connects them to our school district. Today, we also welcomed 300, close to 300 students who had an opportunity to take the PSAT. We relied on close to 100 staff volunteers that supported this effort so that students could safely socially distance take this test. I'd like to thank all our staff uh, involved in engaging this one-time all hands on deck student project. And next, we also want to congratulate and thank the food services staff, our director, Matt Dittman, amazing director, who's now uh, gotten us to reach the 1 million meals served, uh, I guess, goal. And it just speaks to the tremendous effort and work that many of our food services workers have been doing since we closed our campuses in March, but also speaks to the need that many of our families and children have. And so we wanna celebrate this uh, mark in our million dollar meals served. And next board members, as we have talked last week, we saw the, uh, on January 20th, we honored the presidential inauguration of our new United States President Joseph R. Biden. And uh, as we had asked, many of our school communities conducted a flag salute after watching the ceremony on TV across our district and community, including those of us here in the district office. We were also so touched by the powerful voice of Amanda Gorman, the youngest inaugural poet in US history, as well as an award-winning writer and uh, graduate of Harvard University. Born and raised in Los Angeles, she began writing at only a few years of age. Her, her poem, The Hill We Climb, has inspired us as a nation and even across the globe. Tonight, board members, we invite you to join us in or to, to recite to us, excuse me. We invite you to recite to us the line, some of the lines from Ms. Gorman's moving poem. Oh, thank you, Ms. Maldonado, especially for such uplifting news. It really makes us proud to be a part of this district. And although we can't do completely do justice to this poem, since Amanda Gorman herself, the first National Youth Poet Laureate, was spectacular last Wednesday, the five of us are proud to read a few lines from the beautiful poem in order to lift up its powerful message with Santa Barbara Unified community the hill we climb. When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never ending shade? The loss we carry, a sea we must wade. We've braved the belly of the beast. We've learned that quiet isn't always peace. And so we lift our gazes, not to what stands between us, but what stands before us. We close the divide because we know to put our future first. We must first put our differences aside. We lay down our arms so we can reach out our arms to one another. If we're to live up to our own time, then victory won't lie in the blade, but in all the bridges we've made. That is the promise blade, the hill we climb. If we only dare, it's because being American is more than a pride we inherit. It's the past we step into and how we repair it. We will not march back to what was, but move to what shall be, a country that is bruised but whole, benevolent but bold, fierce and free. We will not be turned around or interrupted by intimidation because we know our inaction and inertia will be the inheritance of the next generation. We will rebuild, reconcile, and recover in every known nook of our nation and every corner called our country. Our people, diverse and beautiful, will emerge, battered and beautiful. When day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it, for, those is always, for there is always light. If only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. Thank you, sister board members. And also thank you to Ms. Barnwell who helped us put together these lyrics of the poem. And now we'll continue with our regular board comments and correspondence. I'll start with Ms. Munoz. 
Yes, good evening. Uh, thank you, President Ford. Um, we had that I had the um, honor this uh, month of attending the information night as uh, Superintendent Maldonado mentioned um, that was prepared regarding college and professional careers. It was an outstanding evening and very well organized by Maria Larios Horton and, and her team as well as, as we said, you know, the representative from a UCSB. And I was had the honor of also being, you know, accompanied by President Ford in terms of um, learning about more about the Family Engagement Unit and all the outstanding resources that are available to our families. I learned about the hotline that they have, which is manned from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. and can easily be reached by a direct number of 805-696-2701. And so, you know, just to exemplify an outstanding uh, resource and investment in making sure that our young people are successful and can have their questions answered as well as support for their families. Thank you, President Ford. Thank you, and Ms. sims Martin. Yes, thank you. Uh, every time I think about that poem, it just it's just like a dawn of a new day, <laughs> no matter what part you read. It just is so inspiring. So I'm so grateful to be able to be a part of reading some parts of that 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 inspiration. Um, I just want to report that from the Martin Luther King virtual event, we had some young poets also that had winners and awesome essays and poems that they also um, expressed uh, on, at the event. And just to know that we have some awesome young folks who have voices to speak. And, and it's important. So if you miss that, um, if you miss that, it's on their website, mlksb.com, and you'll be able to re-see that again. So I just wanted to lift up our, our, our young SAers, if you will, and um, our poets here in Santa Barbara County. Thank you. Ms. Caps. Yeah, I wanted to start by uh, congratulating Ms. sims Moten and thanking her for her leadership with the Martin Luther King celebration here in town. And again, uh, you know, we think, oh, the, things aren't, aren't going to be the same, but I watched that, um, that presentation virtually and it was so moving. So there's new elements that you can bring in this virtual world that, that you know, enhance and carry on. But again, just uh, Ms. sims Moten, thank you for all of the work that you've put in for years with that organization. And we'll be out there marching next year, I sure hope. Sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, secondly, uh, I was uh, glad to visit uh, McKinley elementary with uh, uh, Superintendent Maldonado and uh, members of the cabinet. And of course, Karen McBride, our uh, head of the teachers union and meet with some teachers. And of course, also uh, board member Virginia Alvarez and just a good chance to hear from teachers directly as I know uh, Superintendent Maldonado and her team are doing once a week uh, with Karen McBride. And that's such a valuable thing to do uh, to stand in a circle uh, distance wise and hear directly from teachers and, and their questions and their input. Uh, Lastly, just on correspondence, you know, I think there's just so much anxiety. I just wanted to give a nod to that uh, with what's happening in the news as we've touched upon and we did two weeks ago as well, but also with the vaccine and challenges with getting folks their vaccine. And now with the governor's, um, at least to me, surprising uh, order yesterday. So just the correspondence has reflected that, especially from parents. Um, we'll hear more about it with our COVID report and perhaps with our public comment. But I just wanted to, uh, you know, lend my heart to the uh, severe anxiety that our students are feeling, that our parents are dealing with, and our teachers, of course, and our staff. But it feels as though it, we, it, it's at another fever pitch right now. And uh, I'm sure sorry for that. And I hope that tonight, at least in a small way, we'll answer some questions for those parents and teachers and staff that are listening in. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Ms. Alvarez. Yes, thank you. I want to thank Ms. Maldonado and Ms. Mike Ride for inviting me to their listening tour. We made our way to McKinley with Ms. Capps and Santa Barbara Junior High, Harding and Franklin. And we'll be visiting Adams, I believe, shortly. I look forward to meeting all the principals and the teachers. And I have been so impressed by all the care and the interest and the hard work that these teachers are putting for their students. And one constant is that I hear is that they miss their students. When are we getting back? 
And uh, we hope that that will be soon. So thank you, teachers. Thank you, principals. Thank you, Ms. McBride. And thank you, Ms. Maldonado. And I look forward to meeting all the other principals and visiting all the other schools. So thank you. Thank you. I do have a few items. First of all, I, uh, as, as was mentioned, I also participated in the in the two parent information nights about college and career choices. And I wanna echo my gratitude to Maria Larios Horton and all the amazing teammates and colleagues and guests who contributed to this important meeting. I can only add that I think many districts would be so jealous that we have the talent and the motivation to do this. So many thanks. And also, I mean, I guess aside from the really interesting things that we have learned about the potential of Zoom and distance learning, I continue to be very, very concerned about the negative impact of the pandemic on our students and community, aside from the tragedy of illness, death, and economic downturn. Um, and only want to reinforce the boards and the superintendent's number one goal for the year to get students back in person to school as soon as it's safe and sanctioned by public health. And included in that goal is our determined effort to address the uh, emotional and uh, mental health of so many members of our community, especially our students. I attended the Safe Schools Coalition quarterly meeting last week and so many members of this task force elaborated not only what is happening uh, with our youth in terms of crime and self injury, self harm, self medication, but also how these agencies are really doing their best to work together for solutions. And community leader Mark Alvarado uh, also just really shared the grave concern about his a fear that young people are feeling these days, fear of more gang crime or other kinds of crime, fear for their safety, fear for their health. And I just wanna reemphasize the mandate to do whatever we can as a district to work alongside these agencies. And I know Ms. Patricia Madrigal is on it and I'm grateful for that. And finally, it's my turn to also recognize those employees who are retiring from our district after many years of service. Not all of these uh, retirements are happening right now, but we must accept their intent to retire and also try to find some way to celebrate them this spring. So there are seven June certificated retirements and I'd like to read their names. Uh, Julie Bowen, who was uh, a teacher at, is a teacher at Monroe Elementary with 25 plus years of service. William Gorley, also a teacher at Goleta Valley Junior High School with 20 plus years of service. Susan Kipp, a teacher at San Marcos High School is also retiring in June with 36 plus years of service. Joan Merrill at San Marcos High School is retiring with 10 plus years of service. Roberta Nye is a teacher at Santa Barbara High School, retiring with 22 plus years of service. Deborah Rankin is a special education teacher at Monroe Elementary with 21 years of service. And Teresa Stelzer is a special language pathologist with the district, and I worked with her luckily at Peabody uh, with 24 plus years of service. We also have one classified retirement that actually happened this month, and that is Linda Guerreño, uh, who is the student uh, coordinator and community relations uh, director at uh, Dos Pueblos High School with 18 plus years of service. We appreciate your dedication and service to the students of Santa Barbara Unified School District, and we wish you all the best. At this time, we move on to public comments for non-agendized matter um, that, uh, where people have some interest in speaking. Mr. Trujillo, do we have any public comments on non-agenda items? Yes, President Ford, we have uh, eight speakers for this item. Okay, I'd like to also mention that today, because of the number of public comments, we have over, I think, 25, 
They are limited to two minutes each, and they also were informed of this earlier this. Go for it, Ms. Trujillo. That's correct. Um, I will name the first five uh, speakers so they can be ready. And we'll start with Sunita Beal, Sheridan Rosenberg, Roseanne Crawford, Peggy Wilson, Audrey Namziger, Linda Bonet. And I will start with uh, Sunita Beal. Sunita, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Good evening. My name is Sunita Beal, a physician in the community and a parent of two high school students. Supervisor Maldonado and board members, have you thought about next fall or more specifically the academic year 2001 and 2022? If this sounds premature to you, then I will tell you that I disagree. What is being discussed now is actually a discussion about next year. We have had active COVID-19 infections in the United States for almost one year now, and we just passed 100 million infections worldwide. Well, there are over 300 million people living in the United States. So this is a fraction of the people who could potentially be infected. We have several vaccines and the goal right now is to have 85% of adults vaccinated by the end of the summer. We are not talking about children under 16, nor are we taking into account people who choose not to be vaccinated. It is not realistic to plan for a school year that is without COVID infection and some level of restriction. What we do not know is what this will look like. So I ask you again, have you thought about the next academic year? And the relationship to now is that we now have had one year of school in 100% distance learning, and we need to learn from this. The virus is not going away, and if anyone is paying attention to modern education, neither is online learning. This pandemic basically has been a huge disruption for traditional education, but in science, there has always been the idea that what goes wrong has almost as much information as what goes right, and we have that information right in front of us. I'm asking the district to open the lines of communication between all the stakeholders, students, parents, teachers, and school staff. One thing to consider is that this might be therapeutic for everyone involved and a healthy outlet for our extreme frustration. What greater hope is there than to look forward and plan for the future? Please consider these thoughts and I appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Sheridan Rosenberg. Thank you. My name is Sheridan Rosenberg. Well, I'm certainly no stranger to the topic I'm going to discuss. It was only this last board meeting and the board meeting before that I expressed a deep concern with the district's unwillingness to report immediately to parents when there is a predator who has had contact with a student or students to bring other possible victims forward, to warn the community at large, to warn children and to protect them and to warn their parents. On January 15th, the district put out a statement about a most recent news of a teacher who had apparently uh, assaulted a student. And it was described in this statement by the district that the abuse of the student by former Santa Barbara Unified teacher Matef Haramakas in 2017 was reprehensible. I want to tell you what I think is reprehensible is your behavior. I've been with a group of parents starting in 2019, May the Mad Academy, Pablo Sweeney and Dan Williams. Then we had in October of 2019, Marshall Webb was resigned suddenly after it became public that his wife had apparently allegedly had a sexual relationship with a female student when she was a teacher in the Tulare School District, starting when that student was 14 years old for four years. Then you had in November of 2019, the district came forward and made a statement that they were breaking ties with Youth Interactive because a girl had been raped twice by an employee of this nonprofit back in 2014. But it wasn't until she filed that lawsuit in 2019 that the district warned the community about it. And now here we are in January of 2021, when apparently the lawsuit was filed in November of 2020. Right. When are you going to change? Thank you. 
Next, we have Roseanne Crawford. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Oh, good evening. The Santa Barbara Learning Centers that I spoke about last meeting has a new email. It's gmail, sblearningcenters at gmail.com. Many families that are shut out of schools for in-person learning are benefiting from the various churches stepping up, providing a safe study space. And please contact sblearningcenters at gmail.com. There is space. Uh, Regarding this recent lawsuit, it's simply shocking. I don't understand why Child Protective Services was not informed, especially with these minors involved. Uh, the timing is suspect of the recent Black History uh, course that was uh, adopted unanimously. Ethnic Studies now pushed for this class and both Matif Har Machis and his wife, Diane Pugino, co-authored the book Black Afterlives, a history of the militant Black Panther group. Many will be watching to make sure there is no conflict of interest with this book being used in this class, as the authors are in leadership roles with the Ethnic Studies Now group. There's even a picture on their website. As you know, Governor Newsom pushed for Ethnic Studies graduation requirement back to 2023 out because of his concern it was not inclusive of other ethnicities. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next we have Peggy Wilson. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yes, thank you um, board members. Um, I'm also um, really uh, want to voice my opinion about Mr. Harmachis who um, the article in the Independent, um, you know, cites that the district tried to get rid of him and spent a million dollars and they were unsuccessful. But really, um, what is really egregious, and I agree, is that when they couldn't um, convict him, he went back into the school and was allowed to be around students instead of being sequestered off. If you all knew that, he could have been sequestered off. But it seems like there is a definite lack of moral compass in this board. And I, uh, I point to that, to the sex education. I think uh, you guys have taken a different path. But what it seems to me is this is, you know, an open field for adults to prey on children. And um, how many other children are gonna come forward? We don't know, students are gonna come forward, but there is really a lack of responsibility on your part for not taking that teacher, even he, though he wasn't convicted, you could have put him aside somewhere else instead of the uh, havoc he wrecked on one girl, how many others? So, um, it's really sad to see. It's very sad. You're imposing your viewpoints on students and that's gonna go into that new sexual curriculum because that's your, your thing. So thank you. Thank you. Next we have Audrey Nevsiger. Hi, thanks. Um, I'm Audrey Nevsiger. I'm a local parent of a junior high daughter at Santa Barbara USD. I'm a 26 year sex crimes prosecutor, and I am a survivor of Dr. George Tyndall, the notorious gynecologist who abused over 700 women at USC, where I went to law school. I am coming to you tonight. It's been a couple of years since I've come to you because I'm concerned about the latest sex scandal involving the now former teacher, Mr. Haramachis. He is a known danger to our students since 2005, and yet, SBUSD continued to give him access to our children. This looks a lot like institutionally supported abuse. Perpetrators like Haramachis can only abuse multiple victims over a period of years when they are enabled by the institution. Who in this administration made the fateful decision to put him back in a room with kids? Who on the board supported this decision? Does that person or person still have their high paying administrative job or seat on the school board and why? Parents deserve answers to these questions. 
despite the press release claiming you have no power to keep him away from our kids, it is clear that you do because you severed ties with Youth Interactive after a lawsuit was filed by that poor girl who was raped after being plied with marijuana and alcohol by one of their workers. Instead of severing ties with ethnic studies now, you've chosen to get back into bed with Haramachis. And as a parent, I am completely outraged. I think a lot of parents are very concerned. This board has the power to do something about it, and yet you have the lack the will to do it. Our kids deserve to be safe, and it is your duty to protect them. And I challenge you to do so today. Sever ties with Haramachis and any organization with which he works. Protect our children. Thank you. Our next three speakers are Linda Bonet, Angel Lopez, and Jill Rivera. Linda Bonet, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead. Good evening, board. I concur with Sheridan, Peggy, and Audrey. So Mr. Haramakis was accused but not convicted of sexual battery, sexual assault, negligent supervision, hiring and retention, and a quote, among other things. Apparently this went on for many years. He was later criminally charged and convicted. After all this, he still showed up at the school for a meeting as an ethnic studies now member. The school board used 1 million of our tax dollars to fight this case, but didn't take it seriously enough to protect the students from this pedophile continuing his crimes against minor girls. Is it okay with the board to allow young girls to be sexually assaulted repeatedly? How about your daughter, your granddaughter? Is that okay? I have another question for the board. Does Mr. Haramaki's race have anything to do with this outrage? What do I mean by that? Does his race give him a pass for this behavior? Was the board intimidated by him because he's a black man and can play the very old, very tired, but surprisingly sometimes still effective race card. If the pedophile was a white man, would this board do what they should have done in this case and come down hard on him, called the police immediately and fought him at every turn? A question you should think about. Since this didn't happen, how can the board give parents and grandparents assurances that this outrage won't happen again to our daughters and granddaughters? Thank you for your time. And on another subject, real quickly, please, please, please open the schools. My grandkids and many others are sorely underserved by not opening these schools. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Angel Lopez is, it doesn't appear to be online. So I'm going to go ahead and go with Jill Rivera and I'll uh, circle back. Ms. Rivera, can you hear us? Yeah, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Ms. Rivera, we're not able to hear you. Um, your sound is cutting off. I'm sorry. Yeah, we're not able to hear you. Um, I'm sorry, Ms. Rivera, we are not able to hear you. Perhaps you could call back. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay, you can hear me now. Okay, better go now. <laughs> Um, yes, good evening. I um, also have some comments about Mr. Um, Haramakis, and I've been at board meetings uh, when ethnic studies was discussed. In fact, I sat behind him um, at a couple of board meetings, and, um, you know, he was completely, seemed very emboldened to me and, and was received by the board as somebody involved with ethnic studies, which is another nonprofit uh, public private partnership, here we go again. And my concern is, you know, after everything that had transpired with his behavior and he played, he pled no contest, the criminal charges, um, you know, he's, he's fraternizing with students in this ethnic studies capacity with his nonprofit. And we are actively aligned with them as a district. 
And that is a huge concern for me because that is a, an endorsement of, of working with a person that we know has a criminal uh, past and has assaulted students, or at least one student for sure that we know of. But, um, you know, the safety of our students should be paramount to this board. And, you know, for, for folks that all say that you are so concerned with social justice, what about the justice for people that are put potentially in harm's way with a, a person that has a record like this? And, you know, to be in a nonprofit position, working with our district to put together this curriculum, and they are a nonprofit. And, um, you know, this is extremely concerning to me. And I don't, I, I, we deserve better. We deserve better and our children deserve to be protected. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, President Ford, uh, Mr. Angel Lopez is not online. So that concludes our public comment on this item. Thank you so much. Well, since it is 7.15, we will go straight to our regularly scheduled, a little late, COVID-19 report. So I now will ask Superintendent Maldonado and the Executive Cabinet to proceed with, I believe it's report number 14. Thank you, uh, Board President Ford. And I wanna say that I'd like to echo what you said about the number one priority for this cabinet and our leaders at Santa Barbara Unified are to open our schools in a safe uh, manner. But like most other places in the state and our county, we've been hit hard by the latest surge of the virus. We are saddened when we hear of our employees or students who test positive for COVID. You'll hear a little bit more about that later as we track the results and each day as we have seen some of those numbers rise steadily. This is definitely not the scenario we envision or want. We are hopeful that the vaccine will provide many of us relief and a way forward towards safety and a break from the fear and threat of the pandemic. In today's report, you'll have an opportunity to hear more details on the, the, vac the state of the vaccinations, but I also want to take this time to encourage all our employees and the public to continue to wear masks, maintain social distance, avoid large gatherings, and to know that we continue to be committed to reopening our schools, beginning with our youngest learners first. So if, our, if we look at our next slide, you'll recognize that these are the areas that we've been continuing to focus on. I'm uh, extremely confident as I did back in November that we have everything in place and ready to open our schools as soon as the county and the state allow us to do so given some of the changes in the guidelines. And uh, we continue to wait for some of the details of those changes we continue to track and be in constant count, contact with our county health department. I want to thank, as always, our Susan Klein Rothschild, who will give us an update of where we are exactly towards meeting that goal. So, Ms. Susan Klein Rothschild, welcome. Thank you so much for having me again. Um, we are always looking towards what's going on, and we see so much change happening so quickly, it's difficult to predict. This is the most recent data we have, and this was presented by Dr. Do Van Do Reynoso this morning with the Board of Supervisors. You might recall that our adjusted case rate a week ago was 64 cases per 100,000 in the population. Beginning today, the adjusted case rate is 49.5. It's going the right direction. I can honestly say this is the first time in really a couple months that we're headed in the right direction. Uh, we need to get to a case rate of 25 to be able to open for in-person learning. And that's the goal for everyone. We want students and staff back at school safely. We want academic performance and we want them to be in a good emotional place. We wanna to work towards that. You can see most of the state is still in the purple tier. There are very few counties that are not, but as the stay at home order was lifted, we go back to the guidelines from the state of the purple tier, and it outlines for us what can be done and how it can be done safely. Next slide, please. This is the slide we look at frequently to say what is our um, a rate of, Q of COVID-19 and what is the testing positivity percent? So that means everybody who takes the test for COVID, what percentage of those are positive? And when the positivity rate increases, it means we're having a lot of people who are testing positive. That means there's more COVID in our community and it's less safe for all of us. So you'll see to the far right side of your screen that it's starting to go down. 
And we are grateful for that. That's what we need. We had seen the increases with COVID after the holidays, after family gatherings. It's very important that we are all vigilant. We all continue face coverings. We all continue physical distance. We wanna get that number down. We wanna be in that red tier so all school students can return to school safely. Next slide, please. This slide is showing us our case rate. We talk about the case rate a lot. This is a seven day average of the case rate. And I mentioned it was at 64 and now it's down to 49.5. Thank goodness it's starting to head downward. I think the last few weeks have been difficult for all of us to just see the large number of cases. We had our highest number of cases in one day on January 9th with almost 800 cases. So our hope is that this continues to go downward, that we continue to see fewer cases in our community, that means we are all safer. And that means we're all closer to being ready to return for in-person instruction. Next slide, please. I thought it'd be helpful to talk a little bit about what are we seeing in Santa Barbara County? We know that nationally and globally looking at children in school, that we see there's less transmission of, of COVID amongst children in school than there is outside of school. And that they children tend to be have less severe virus illness. In Santa Barbara County, these are local numbers. And this is approximately one month period of time. So for the youngest children, zero to five, you can see we have the smallest number of positive cases over the period. But note, between November and December versus December and January, everything went up. All of those family visits and vacations and holidays, we saw a lot more COVID. So it went from 58 cases to 122. But we also see children six to 12 have almost twice as many cases as children zero to five, important. So our elementary and, and youngest children have the lowest number of positive COVID cases. The more the older children are, the more likely it is that they become positive with COVID. And again, you can see those numbers. So from November to December, mid month, we had a total of 384 children test positive. Mid-December to January, 898. We have got to get that down. If there's more COVID in our community, that means it's more likely children and staff will bring it to school and then transmit it. The, when we get to 25 cases per 100,000 by the state guidelines, we will be ready to, to open up school and starting with the youngest ages. Next slide, please. So, there is new guidance from the state. It was just put out uh, January 14th, I believe. It's based on most recent science and what we know. Um, we know that the frequency of infection with elementary school age children is much lower and the disease is much less severe. So when we return to school, the guidelines from the state is to begin with elementary school children. Um, and in all of our cases that you can see from the numbers I showed previously, we do contact tracing. We find out how was this transmitted? Where might this person have, have contracted the virus? And in most situations, it's not at school. It's at home. It's someone in their household. I want to just reemphasize schools and teachers and leaders. They follow guidance well, and that's what keeps our kids and staff straight, uh, safe. And the core strategies, those are the ones that the research is showing us, these are most effective at stopping transmission. You might recall about a year ago, we thought that transmission was very common from touching things and having contact with hard surfaces or, or pass through contact. We now know it's much more common person to person. So keys to moving in person, phase it in with elementary school first, work with the state. The state's got a hotline. The state has a, a team to help with accountability and be prepared to do so. And I think Santa Barbara Unified has begun to have things in place, have the safety plan in place, have the steps ready, all the work that, that's been done in regard to ventilation. All those things help this district be ready. So when we hit that mark, I think SB Unified will be ready to open. And that mark is that 25 per 100,000 residents. Thank you, I think that's my last slide. Oh, vaccinations, thank you. This is very important. Okay, we all want vaccinations and we want them now. That's my, I think that's our goal, right? Vaccinations are important and they're going to be very, very important to help us 
return to something of a normal environment. We have a, a county, our county is well prepared. They have a good plan for vaccination. They have a lot of people invested. The biggest barrier right now is the supply of vaccine. And we don't have control at the local level about that supply. I'd like to share a couple of things that we've learned in the past few days that I've learned. First of all, the vaccine is distributed from the federal government to the county. The county has distributed 81% of its supply of vaccine to healthcare providers, hospitals, clinics, other community providers. They are helping vaccinate all of our healthcare workers. And they've begun vaccinating people over the age of 75. Next are essential workers, including educators. And we've all been so eager, when will that be? That is highly dependent on the supply of vaccine. I don't know if any of you were able to listen to the news shortly before this meeting started, but um, President Biden, our new president, and the federal government has indicated they have come into new contracts with two of the vaccine providers, Moderna and Pfizer, each for 100 million more doses. The federal government is saying two things, and this I'm just telling you from the news, I don't hear this from public health. The federal government is saying that they will have enough vaccine to cover all adults in the country by the end of summer. And they are saying they will begin to increase distribution of vaccine to local communities over the next few weeks. Here at the county, I know that we don't know how much vaccine will be coming until a week before it arrives. So we cannot schedule appointments, we cannot um, plan in detail until we know what vaccine is available. I'm very hopeful hearing the news from the federal government, our county is ready. Our schools are ready. Our county health department is ready to be efficient and effective when we get the vaccine. And hopefully that vaccine supply will increase and increase quickly so we can get the vaccine out to our partners. I know everywhere I go and probably where most of you go, one of the big questions is, when is it my turn? When will I get the vaccine? And I just wanted to share some ways that people can keep on top of what is our status vaccinating? Who are we vaccinating now? And what are we doing in Santa Barbara County? And at the bottom of this slide, it just shows you that the, we can all look on the county website, on the sbcphd.org website. There is a tab under COVID on vaccine specifically. So we'll have accurate information. There is a weekly press conference at 4.30 every Friday afternoon here in Santa Barbara County, where people can watch our health department leadership, our director, Dr. Bondo Reynoso, as well as our health officer and others talk about the current status of the vaccine. Monitor the local media. And the state is bringing us a new app that we can get. It's called My Turn. It's currently being piloted in Los Angeles County and San Diego County. And it'll be a way for people to sign up and know when it's their turn to get the vaccine. Again, the biggest factor is having enough vaccine supply to follow through on the tiers and the vaccination that we're also looking forward to. And I think that's an important caveat at the bottom of the slide too. The vaccines that have been approved have been approved for youth either 16 or 18 years of age and older. And that those are the people we're talking about at vaccinating. We do not yet have an approved vaccine for children. That's still under investigation and research. With that, I'll let move pass it on. Dr. Oh, right. go ahead. Sorry. Uh, good evening, Superintendent Maldonado, uh, President Ford, and the board. Um, uh, thank you, Susan Klein Rothschild, for for walking us through that. Um, it feels like we're making progress uh, little by little here. Um, so, Governor Newsom's update at the end of December. Um, gave us great hope. Uh, and tonight we want to talk a little bit about um, now that we're a month a month away from that announcement, what does that really mean for us? What are our thoughts and responses? There are four pillars to the governor's um, framework of his safe schools plan. And um, one is funding to support the reopening. And you know, reopening means not merely bringing students back onto campus, um, with learning occurring in person, of course, that is the most important part, but it also means addressing the impact 
that a year of being physically separated from school has had on students and staff. It, it really, our focus is also learning recovery and attention to the pandemic trauma. Um, those are the things that are in the forefront of our minds. So the funding that's proposed in this plan um, is encouraging because it will aid us in adding the resources that we need in order to um, not just make sure that students um, learn the content um, that should be delivered this year, but really address the impact of the pandemic on their overall learning and well being. Um, Another key piece of this, uh, the pillar, is, is the safety mit mitigation piece. And the proposed plan um, looking at vaccinations and access to PPE, including N95 masks for teachers, um, is something we appreciate. Um, the commitment from the state uh, is very helpful, especially if it makes teachers feel safer while they're on campus to have access to these uh, surgical masks. And then in terms of vaccinations, Susan just shared with us what we're looking at. It really is dependent on the supply and, um, and having enough people to deliver those, that supply of vaccines. But we're hopeful that educators will be receiving those vaccines in the near future. We know that we're so close to the front of the line um, it's just unclear exactly when that's going to happen, but we appreciate that the state um, has prioritized educators so that we can get school open. Um, next, um, the, the state has really looked um, at oversight and assistance. Um, they promised that they will, there will be hands on oversight and assistance to the schools and and also there'll be a consistency between our local public health department and the California Department of Public Health and those who um, oversee OSHA in terms of guidance and regulations. And we do our best to try to pass along to you, the school board, uh, the best information that we can. And it's been so helpful to have Susan join us several times a month um, for the last six months or so. Um, so the new plan, we feel as district leaders that we're going to be getting clearer guidance, better guidance than we have had. Um, yesterday, um, in terms of another piece related to this um, is transparency and accountability. And yesterday, school districts across the state reported their reopening status in the newly developed statewide public data system. Um, districts, including our own district, will be updating our status every two weeks. And really what this does is provide staff and parents and members of the community a clear picture of where each district is in its reopening process. Um, in terms of this transparency and accountability, the state has also created a dashboard that's a, a one-stop shop uh, for assistance and resources. I visited it today. And while I was very thankful, I really found myself wishing it had existed these past six, eight months. Um, but we'll be grateful for what we have now. It, it, um, it is nice to have all of those resources in one place um, while we're doing this work to get schools open. And then finally, um, the state is developing an anonymous reporting system, which we do welcome. You know, if a member of our community has concerns about safety in our schools, we wanna know about it so that we can investigate. And since last July, we have received a handful of reports of community re concerns that were, that were um, reported to County Public Health. And, and sometimes these have been legitimate and other times uh, merely a misunderstanding, but either way, oversight of this type of accountability is something we welcome because investigating and responding really uh, makes our already strong safety system even better. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, 
looking here and I'm looking off to my left because I'm reading off two screens right now, but um, the public health criteria for when schools are permitted to be open, it's really important that folks understand um, where we are now in January, as opposed to five months ago in August, um, there have been changes. So um, there've been no changes to our small cohorts. Um, however, there have been changes for transitional kindergarten through grades 12. In our elementary schools, um, back in the fall, um, we could open up school if we were in the red tier for 14 days, um, unless an elementary school um, applied for a waiver. Now that has changed. And as we talked about uh, the last few meetings and now um, earlier tonight, we're looking to get to that point where we're at a our county meets a five day average of case rates below 25 cases per 100,000 people. Um, we no longer have the waiver process. We do, need, do not need to apply for the waiver. However, uh, we do have to submit a plan to the state, uh, which is um, being submitted to the, tonight, in fact, after this meeting. So we are ready. And when we get to that point where we're at 25 cases per 100 people or lower, we will open our elementary schools in hybrid. We're ready to do it today. Um, our case rate, as Susan shared, is at 49. We welcome that um, those, those numbers continuing to drop so that we can open. And then let's talk um, quickly about grades seven through 12. Um, I was talking to some high school students today um, during, after the PSAT and I really saw in them that they don't believe that they'll be back to school this year. And I told them, don't give up hope. Don't give up hope because we could return and I hope we will. When we get to the point where we're in the red tier for five days in a row without falling out of the red tier, then we can return our students grade seven through 12 to school in person. And we plan to do that. We are ready, we will be ready. Next slide, please. Okay, and I will turn it over to Dr. Becchio to talk to you about proposed staff and student testing. Thank you. Good evening, board members, board president Ford, Superintendent Maldonado. Thank you for um, giving the opportunity to bring an update regarding staff and student testing. This is Dr. Becchio, it's very difficult to hear you. Oh, sorry, can you hear me? A little better, yes, thanks. How's that? Can you hear me okay now? Yes, thank okay. you. Anyways, um, it is great to bring, uh, have the opportunity to bring to you a, a update on testing. For sure, student testing in particular is a um, pretty hot topic right now across the state. Um, there are a lot of unanswered questions still, and I think superintendents across the state are trying to um, make sense of what student testing would look like, how to implement it, what the cost is going to be. There are really three variables that are um, of interest to us with respect to student testing. And um, they're here before you on the slide. Cost is one of them. And we you know, estimate that um, the amount we'll receive from the state grant would be 37, 370 per ADA, which would be um, roughly that 4.6 million. And then an estimated cost of testing students and stuff, but this is elementary only, would be 3.5 million. And I wanted to give you that data on cost. Um, the other two variables, staffing and time that it would take to test students are variables that, um, that we're very concerned about. The staffing is, is not just, you know, who's gonna administer the test to the students, but um, who's going to uh, get the test kits, deliver the test kits, uh, retrieve the test kits, um, and then deliver them back to the lab. And so those are all questions about staffing, staff time that's going to be required in that. 
And then um, just the variable of time that we're um, concerned about is the amount of time that it will take to test on a weekly basis. Just elementary would be somewhere near 3,000, 3,300 kids. Um, and that doesn't include staff testing either. So we're concerned about instructional time, where in the day that's going to take place, how long it will take us to test each student. Can we test them in groups? Um, can, uh, do the, does, does there need to be privacy when they do their tests? So these are all um, unanswered questions that, that we need to um, uh, find answers to from, from the state. And, and I think our county um, public health is gonna be a, a great supporter in helping us with those answers. I wanted to bring you that update and um, pass this uh, on to Mr. Rickman at this point. Thank you very much. Good evening, uh, Superintendent Maldonado, President Ford and board members. Uh, based on the feedback we got at the last board meeting about student struggles with connectivity, we sent out a survey uh, where we surveyed sixth through 12th graders uh, to see what their experience with Wi-Fi is. Uh, we had a 10% response rate, and I wanted to go over uh, what our findings were. Uh, the first question we asked was, what type of Wi-Fi do you primarily use at home? And you'll see that 96% of our respondents reported that they use Cox Internet. 2% responded that they use a district hotspot. And 2% uh, responded they use some other form of Wi-Fi. Uh, these, these, these questions that I'm going to go over now are specifically with regard to Cox service. We asked, how often do you experience slow Wi-Fi performance during Zoom classes? 3% of our students said they always do. 14% said often. 41% said sometimes. 35% said never. And 6%, or sorry, said rarely. And 6% uh, said never. We then asked the question about how often do you get dropped? How often do you have dropped connections while attending your Zoom classes? Uh, on Cox, 1% oh, of our students said always, 10% said often, 34 said sometimes, 45 said rarely, and 7% and said never. Uh, next slide, please. So these are the responses with regard to the district provided hotspots. We asked the same questions. Uh, first question is how often do you experience slow Wi-Fi performance? 17% uh, of the response, 17% of the respondents said they always do, 20 said often, 49% said sometimes, 11% said rarely, and 3% said never. Um, with the question about dropped connections with our district provided hotspots, 11% 11 per, 11 of our students said that they always get dropped. 23% uh, said often, 46% said sometimes, 17% rarely, and 3% never. And we're gonna be reaching out to these students uh, to offer support and uh, see how we can help troubleshoot the issues uh, and possibly replace the hotspot if needed. And now I believe I'm handing it off back to Dr. Wagnick. Thank you, Mr. Rickman. Um, President Ford and the board, I'd like to bring you some uh, data updates from our own district. Um, as of 4 p.m. today, We've had 97 um, positive cases of COVID on site, meaning on in our schools or in district offices. 20 of those cases have been students and 77 are staff. And uh, really looking more intensely at the second wave of COVID uh, since we returned on Jan January 4th from winter break, we've had 62 cases on school sites or in district office. So two thirds of the cases have come in the last three weeks. 55 staff and students are currently on quarantine um, at the direction of our district nurses. I, I wanna clarify because um, here to the board, but also to the community to make sure that folks are aware that when we report these cases, these are positive cases on campus. These are not um, all the positive cases for our staff and our students 
Um, we know that those numbers are much higher, um, but rather these are just um, the folks who are coming onto campus on a regular basis. Next slide, please. All right, and looking at our small cohorts. So when we talk about the number of cases, um, it's important to look at who is on campus. So in, in addition to support staff and administrators, um, we have 96 academic small cohorts and 18 elective small cohorts um, operating at this time. Um, almost 1400 students are being served in these cohorts. Um, another nearly a thousand students are participating in athletics. And, and so this represents nearly 20% uh, of all of our students. One in five are involved in a small cohort of some sort or uh, in athletics. So in total, they're supported by nearly 400 staff directly. And then again, hundreds of others um, in terms of support staff and administration. So think about that. We're talking about uh, a large number of folks and a relatively small number of um, positive cases on campus. And only eight known cases of COVID have been transmitted on district property. Uh, you, you may be reflecting on the fact that, that I was very proud for a number of months to say we'd had no known cases transmitted on district property. Um, and then uh, and then we had one case the last time I reported and, and today it is eight. So drilling down further into that data, I wanna be really clear of what we're looking at. One of those eight cases was a student who contracted COVID on campus. Two were our instructional staff, either teachers or paraprofessionals and five were non-instructional staff. Now this is, is a notable increase from two weeks ago. Um, however, I do wanna highlight that with over 2,500 individuals working and going to school on our campuses each day, that's um, a 0.032% um, infection rate on campus. So our protocols and our procedures work when we work them. Um, I cannot emphasize that enough. Um, and while we are not happy that we've had any cases um, transmitted on campus, um, we, think, um, we think that that number is something that, uh, that is actually going to, to end and we don't expect to see high numbers of transmission happening on our campuses now that this great second wave of COVID seems to be declining. Next slide. Okay. I did want to come back to you uh, about six weeks ago. Um, I brought you the numbers for actual uh, cohorts uh, occurring on our campuses. Um, a reminder that on January 4th, we had a reset of our small cohorts and um, actually students came back on the 11th for athletics. Um, and you can see that again, I want to remind you that 25% of students is the maximum number that can be brought back on campus um, in small cohorts or athletics. I, I wanna point out, um, I think, things to cheer about. Everything should be celebrated during COVID when we can. Um, I really wanna call out Cleveland Elementary, Harding Elementary and Santa Barbara Community Academy um, for, for exceeding 20% of their students, um, one in four, one in five students being enrolled in small cohorts um, at this time and, and saying that we're continuing to support the other schools in opening more cohorts. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. We'll take a look at secondary. Um, parents and, you know, there's some reasons and we see um, lower numbers in, um, in secondary. Um, 
parents and students have been reluctant to attend during this um, second wave of COVID. And it's it's been scary. Um, as safe as our schools are, um, we understand why folks are hesitant. But, but I um, appreciate our principals so much as they're continuing to try to create more opportunities in order to maximize the number of students in attendance in the small cohorts. Um, and and it, I have to mention also that in addition to reluctance on the part of students and families, staffing, um, as we've reported uh, previously, is also a concern. And, but Dr. Becchio and I are meeting each week. Uh, we come together, we discuss the small cohort hiring needs and try to match that up with the staffing that has been hired, making sure that we prioritize the expansion of these academic small cohorts um, so that we can bring more students onto campus as quickly um, as possible. Um, I'd also like to, to point out that and remind the board that in addition to the small cohorts on our um, K through 12 schools. We do have our preschools that are running. We have two co cohorts with eight um, children. And then our staff child care continues to operate 10 cohorts with a total of 105 students. And again, those are children of our staff um, on four of our campuses. Next slide. And then finally, um, last week, uh, the California Interscholastic Federation, Federation made an announcement that um, fall sports championships would be canceled due to pandemic con uh, uh, conditions. Um, they do not feel at this time that um, because of the timeline and what's going on with COVID that they can play enough league games in order to hold the championships. However, there is still time for these fall uh, sports, cross country football, girls volleyball, and water polo to have some sort of a season. And uh, I am hoping that we can get to that point as well. Even if, even if they don't have much more than a month of competition, um, I, I hope that they'll be able to realize that. And so we wanted to pass pass that information along to you. And at this point, I will uh, pass it off to Mr. Dittman to talk about food services. Uh, Mr. Dittman's not here, but I will read this one. This is 1 million meals served as of last week, I believe. And um, it's, just, it's just amazing how well our staff and food service has done. They've been there since day one and they've never quit. And it's just really impressive that we've met the 1 million mark. We're probably over that by now. And with also help from Food Bank and still we are receiving meals from UCSB, which is very helpful. They keep getting funded and we keep providing food for our um, families and, and students. So we celebrate the 1 million meals served. And I'll pass that on to Superintendent Maldonado. Thank you, Mr. Tay and Dr. Wagenegg. So board members, at this point, you might be asking, well, does it sound like they're gonna open after hearing all this news? And the answer is yes and yes. And we remain hopeful and positive and optimistic because as uh, Susan Klein Rothschild has reported, the trend is going now in the right direction, which is that our case rate is going down. Uh, we do want to make sure board members that you and the public are aware that we are being very transparent with all of our data in an effort to ensure that everyone understands that what is happening in our schools and that we don't um, in any way mislead the public or uh, board members as well. So all the information you just heard, while it may sound like there's things that are happening in schools, kids are getting sick, why would you wanna say you're opening? Because it's the right thing for kids and we know we need it. So I want you to know that in this slide, you can see that we have our timeline we have uh, met some of the things that we said we were going to do. We continue in distance learning. We are hopeful, optimistic that we're going to get to the less than 25 cases. 
In the next coming week, weeks, board members, we will be reaching out to our elementary families to reconfirm their selection for their children's program model, whether that's continuing to be in distance learning or in our hybrid programs. So that'll be coming up next. And we know that um, we are ready, as Susan Klein Rothschild has said in our video last night and tonight, uh, to open uh, our schools as soon as all our community gets to this uh, case rate of infections that is more manageable, but that also sends a signal that our schools matter. They're the heart of our community and uh, we would want nothing more than to be able to do that. So thank you, that concludes our report. Thank you so much. It reminds me of that old TV commercial, open, open, open. And yes, that is our number one goal. So before we go to board comments and questions, I believe we have a couple public comments tonight on this uh, board report. So I turn it over to Ms. Trujillo. Thank you, President Ford. Yes, we have two speakers for this item is Ms. Karen McBride and Shannon Shorter. I'll start with Karen McBride. Uh, good evening, um, President Ford and uh, members of the board and Superintendent Maldonado. Um, in light of some of the, the comments that I heard in your report, I'm gonna modify my comments a little bit today, but I wanted to share with you that I attended the meeting of the California State Senate Budget Subcommittee on Education last week. And um, it really gave me a larger context to consider what's happening in our district regarding um, reopening in the district's um, then consideration of the Safe Schools Plan, uh, Safe Schools for All Plan. Um, I, I guess tonight is, uh, as Ms. Wagonek said, you are um, submitting the application is what it sounds like. And um, I just wanna represent the fact that one of the big concerns that um, SBTA and, and our larger affiliate CTA have is that um, the monies that this uh, $450 per pupil is coming from, or I, I think that um, for, for some reason, your slide said that it was $370 per pupil, but regardless, it's coming out of Prop 98 funds, which I think the public should know is money that is allocated every year. It's a law that requires minimum levels of state education spending and um, so that money would be um, allocated. And I guess a qu my question would be, what kind of funding would the district receive from Prop 98 um, when we weren't in a pandemic situation? Because my point is that the reality is that even when we return to in-person instruction of some sort, it's still not gonna include all students at the same time. It's still gonna leave students with access inequities and it's still gonna beg the need for robust interventions and to help students who are falling behind. As, as you guys reported, uh, I appreciate that consideration. So um, it, it sounds like there's gonna be a little slush money there after you know, you've know you budgeted for testing kids. I want you to, uh, I, I'm gonna ask that you carefully um, take into consideration the stakeholders that are involved and, and um, and reach out to the educators who are prov providing interventions, et cetera. And um, I'm, yeah, I'll just conclude there. Thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. Our last speaker is Shannon Schroeder. Hi, um, I'm gonna slightly alter my comments as well, just based on a couple of things. I am confused, so I'm gonna read what I've written, but. Um, I'd like a little bit of clarity on if we are opening K2 when it starts back up or K6 when we reach that 25 per 100,000. But I am happy to hear a change of tune, Ms. Maldonado, a little bit of hopefulness and positivity on your end and actually saying that uh, the right thing for kids to do is to be back in school. So that makes a marked shift in tone from the usual. So. Um, I'm speaking tonight to advocate for my elementary age children and all the children in Santa Barbara Unified who have the right to attend in-person school. At this juncture in time, we appear to be at a standstill. We're using the governor as a scapegoat and blaming the fact that we can't open our doors on the lack of complete guidance necessary to open. Current COVID rates aside for a moment, you simply cannot ignore the fact that a number of our neighboring schools are open and remain open without this new guidance. Because they were prudent and timely in seeking their waiver, 
their students and staff can go to school every day and are not subjected to these new guidelines. Their teachers do not need to undergo enhanced testing. Their students will never be COVID tested and new even more stringent hurdles do not need to be met. Yet they remain open and they remain open safely. It makes absolutely no sense. The number of times we have changed our position as a district and backpedaled and moved forward and gone back again is maddening. Let's not forget that there was a time back in October when we were in the red tier and we could have opened safely without a waiver when our case rate was approaching an infection rate of four per 100,000. Now, because of your indecision and inability to take action, we're looking at waiting until case rates fall to 25 per 100,000 before we can open our elementary schools. I do hope you realize the irony of the situation. Sadly though, our children are paying the price for what any rational outsider would view as extreme lack of preparation, planning and decision-making. Yet at the heart of all of this are our children who are declining on all fronts daily. Academics are certainly suffering, but more importantly, we have a mental health crisis affecting nearly all kids, not just those classified as vulnerable populations. I'm I certainly understand the desire for teachers to feel safe, but what about the students left home alone while their parents work? Our children deserve better. Thank you. Commissioner Ford, that concludes public comment on this item. Well, thank you so much. And so now I'll uh, go to board members and ask if they have questions of certain um, presenters or certain data. First, Ms. Munoz. Uh, thank you, President Ford. Um, <clears throat> I would like to very much ex express the appreciation for the update provided by all of the presenters in the district and to Susan Klein Rothschild um, for the updated information and for also for giving us hope. <laughs> Uh, the partnership with public health and the board of supervisors in our community with the school district has been superb um, and everyone's efforts are very much appreciated <clears throat> other than questions i have you know from the presentation just to also in hope of the decrease in rates and seeing that trend i know that um, <clears throat> we all want our students to return to the classroom both for their academics and for their mental health. And I am also encouraged by the fact that, you know, the next um, on the list for vaccinations are essential workers, such as our teachers, our staff and childcare workers. Um, <clears throat> I very much invite the community, all 201 participants and the, all of those of us who are participating to help us with safe practices, mass social distancing, um, and, you know, only going out when it's needed and so forth, so that we can do this. And I know that the five days in the red tier, we can do sooner than later. So thank you so much. I, I look forward to having our students back in school. Thank you. Indeed. Um, thank you. Ms. Sims Moten. Uh, yes, thank you. I would also want to echo Ms. Munoz's uh, comments, all of those things that said with regards to this is a very uh, comprehensive report tonight, updated report, given the last minute updates from the states. I think we responded really well with regards to that and where we've always been working toward getting our schools, getting our schools open safely and certainly getting our students back there uh, in a safe manner so that they, they can stay, they feel safe and everybody's there that's teaching and, and getting our focus back on, on education and recognizing the, 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 just the human toll that this whole in event has been taken on us as a whole. And I just think about what we've had to move. I, I look at the district as a huge, big old cruise ship that has to turn. That's huge. And it takes a whole lot of energy and time and space and everybody moving and rowing at the same at the same um, time to, to turn the ship. And so I think that we've been doing that. And I, I understand the frustrations of the decisions that we've had to make. I think we've made the best decisions given the information that we had, certainly with the partnership that we have with um, with the public health giving us that that information and I have every um, belief that we are going to open up our schools in a safe manner and we're going to open it and do it as soon as possible. And I know that we've learned an awful lot about how in the midst of a crisis what we need to do and how we need to respond and I want to appreciate the staff who continues to work hard every day to make sure they're moving all aspects to make sure we are fully ready uh, when we um, when it comes time to we get notice to open up our schools. 
Um, and I, I just had a question more for clarification. So I heard Dr. Vaughn, Dr. Dave Reynoso today say that, it, that waivers are no longer available or we no longer have to do a waiver. So is the, the plans, is it a safety plan that's now? We're not concerned about a waiver anymore. It is more about a plan um, to get us reopened. Yes, Ms. Sims Moulton, the state, as they made their change in the process, they said, we're not gonna use a waiver anymore. We're going to have, based on everything we've learned from science, we know what things, what safety measures work and what things don't work. All schools, those that are open or those that are not open, need to have a safety plan. It includes COVID safety plan items, it includes things that are required for Cal OSHA. Schools that have not yet returned for in-person learning, they submit their safety plan to the public health department. We help review it with them and it's approved. Schools that have already opened, they also have to submit the same safety plan and they have to post it on their website. And after the schools get it approved, they post it on their website. So all schools are looking at the same criteria, the same things that we know work to help limit tra transmission and keep kids safe. So yes, the safety plan, but I would say to you, SB Unified did prepare for a waiver and all those things that were prepared, those are going to be quite vital and relevant to the safety plan. So all that work has been very helpful and will help you. And I understood from uh, Dr. Wagenack, we'll be submitting it soon so we can get approval ahead of time. So you are ready. When that case rate hits that number for five days, you can move forward. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Clark and Rochelle. You've been most helpful and most informative because that was my confusion as opposed to we no longer need a waiver. What does that mean? And the fact that, uh, that it's all schools are going to need that safety plan. It's not just the ones who are trying to reopen it in the, in the midst of this. So thank you very much for that information. Thank you. Ms. Capps. Yeah, thanks to all of our speakers. I just want to start off by uh, kudos to the food service workers. Uh, to reach a million meals served in this pandemic. That is a massive effort. Lots of early mornings, putting on masks uh, to serve our families and what that means to our families and our entire community. So keep it up. I'm, we're here to support and uh, help get the word out of the meals. Again, just so vital. And uh, thanks to Matt and thanks to Meg and all of the team that, that makes all of that happen. So I'm really, really pleased. And we need to celebrate, as Dr. Wagnick said, uh, in this very dire, hard time uh, akin to World War II, we need to lift us, each other up and focus on positive as much as we possibly can while dealing with the realities. And so um, Ms. Sims Moten kind of beat me to the punch here. I think it's just so important to talk about the waiver uh, because I, you know, we're still getting a lot of emails, understandably, from parents about when are the, the waiver, the waiver, the waiver, because again, that for months, that was the focus. Um, so uh, may, perhaps Ms. Barnwell can put something on our website um, explaining, again, that the, the process has changed yet again by our state, and we're adjusting to that, um, and that we don't have to wait for a waiver. Once we get to the 25, it's five days. I'm just looking for affirmation of that, uh, Susan Klein Rothschild, so that it's very clear. We don't have to then apply for a waiver and then it's three weeks or whatever, but essentially once we get to 25 cases per 100,000, we have, and we stay in that for five days, we can then open. I see your head nodding. Yeah, it's the steps. It's 25 per 100,000 over an average of five days. So it, it takes a few days. But if yeah. you have your safety plan and everything approved ahead of time, you have no, no other additional steps you need to go through. And Excellent. I think, honestly, all, all the planning that I've heard over the last couple months, I've heard of all those reviews and tours of schools and ventilation and steps with, with, uh, with staff, with students. I've talked to many of your nurses about steps taken when there's a positive case. I feel like I've heard the, the, the district take a lot of proactive steps to be ready. So when you hit that number, there's nothing else that's a barrier for you. Excellent, thank you so much. And speaking of being proactive, I do have um, some questions for Superintendent Maldonado. I wanna preface by saying, uh, I just appreciate your positive tone throughout this process, throughout the last, since you came on board and certainly through the pandemic of always re of stating the goal, which is to open our schools. Uh, you in fact have you know expressed frustration as many parents have about the sort of bifurcated way in which schools right now are being treated. Those who opened in the fall can stay open, yet those who um, 
uh, you know, like our situation that we weren't able to. So you, you know, that letter to the governor is public. Um, uh, the, I want to just ask you a couple questions more sort of about process and and potentially some times for future meetings of topics because uh, one of our speakers raised good points about proactive thinking and I know the team is thinking proactively about summer school about the fall uh, I think it would be good to focus these reports sooner than later on the some of that initial thinking so that the impression isn't erroneously given that we're, we're just focused on January 26th, but we're actually looking uh, to these next phases. So it's really a, a kind of a suggestion. I think it's one that you're already working on. So I appreciate that. But I, I for one, I think summer school is such an opportunity. Um, and I'm glad to hear that there's already a plan in place. But if we could start to bring some of those plans, even when they're not fully baked to the public, I think that would help give people a real sense of our thinking and, and allow for input and uh, assurance that we're not waiting for anything, we're moving forward. So I'll let you just address that if that's helpful. Absolutely, Board Member Caps. And I want you to know that we do have those plans in place. We have, uh, we do wanna make sure we do some internal inside of our house sort of outreach to our teachers first and make sure that we are getting everybody on board on our dates that we're selecting so that we can understand what those plans will look like, how we will go about, um, deciding the different uh, kinds of programs that will be needed based on our student needs. And of course, based on our staffing availability. But we, we do have a team that has always been our forward working team that you know complements some of this work. Many of us are on both teams because we are a smaller uh, group of people here in Santa Barbara Unified. Um, I will be happy to turn some of these uh, reports into more about what is our forward planning and our action plans in the next six to nine months so that you guys can get a really great picture of what that looks like. And absolutely our school staff, I just wanna give a huge thanks and shout out to our principals, to our counselors, to our deans, assistant principals who are working on that, that core work that is planning the 21-22 school year even when we're trying to figure out what happens in the spring, how are we gonna try to continue to create these opportunities and experiences that our children need, particularly our seniors in high school. So lots of work is being done. Obviously in a board meeting like we have here, there's only so much we can cover for you unless we wanna stay on through the night, which we don't wanna do to the public and to you as board uh, members, but we will definitely turn our attention and bring some more of that forward thinking plan. Great, and at the risk of suggesting things you're already thinking of doing, um, you know, the, I was talking with a parent today about Peabody and how good it would be to learn from their uh, their ex experience. So, you know, bringing in not necessarily to a board meet to a board meeting, but potentially, you know, just bringing in some of those examples of what's been working. How can we build on that? You know, with schedules, things have been made adjustments. Obviously, we have board member Virginia Alvarez with us who works at Montecito Union. So we have that in-house, but that, you know, just again, I'm such a big believer in borrowing from best practices that are working elsewhere. I I loved hearing from Steve Vizzolini that our ventilation project, um, you know, he got a call from another uh, higher ed institution in town. So the more that we are doing that, and also, you know, again, with everything you're doing, letting some transparency, letting some, uh, some folks know about those best practices that are being shared uh, because it just again uh, in a time of such anxiety um, would be helpful. Um, two more points I have just one quick question for Susan Klein Rothschild again uh, with the governor's um, lifting of the stay-at-home order do you anticipate this new rubric of 25 cases per 100,000 changing? Like everything with COVID it really comes down to our behavior right? <laughs> So if we have a commitment to wearing masks and physical distance and we as a community continue that, we, we can get it down. I believe we can. Uh, I think the high school students within SB Unified who started the Red Pledge, you know, the students who said, we pledged, we're going to do our part to help get down to the red tier so we can come back to school so we can have our proms and our sports and our activities. We all need to do that as a community. I'm an optimist by nature. I think we can do it. And I think we can all do it together. And we are so 
eager to do it because I think we saw, all of us saw what happened after the holidays and none of us want to go through that again, quite honestly. But the, the number 25 is the set number and you don't anticipate that changing from the state. I do not, that is from the governor. That is what has been said, it is what's been published. I do not expect it. I have to be honest, we, we see changes all the time, but at this I point, I do not expect that change. I understand. And again, I'm just kind of repeating things because some of the emails in the last couple of days have been, you know, you guys need to open schools. We cannot open our schools. I should, they are open. We cannot return to in-person uh, until we reach that 25. So it is not in our uh, ability to do so. So thanks for unpacking that. Um, my last point or question really is for Todd Rickman on this helpful survey to see. I really appreciated that on, on high uh, Wi-Fi. Um, I wanted to ask if the survey was broken down by socioeconomics. I know there's an ability to do that with Parent Square because I, I just think that that would have a, everything to do with that survey. Uh, this is based on a conversation I had with future leaders of America and they pointed out that uh, many low-income families that have the sort of base rate with Cox, um, uh, the 999 are really, you know, experiencing a lot more difficulties with their children uh, being able to have continuous service. So was that survey, was there an emphasis on socioeconomics? We didn't break it out for this uh, presentation, but I can certainly get you that information. Yeah, I think it'd be helpful to see that um, because again, high speed, high speed and low speed, it makes a world of difference. So if there's anything we can do to focus our efforts, I know it's something I flagged for you last week. And so I appreciate the effort that's already going into it. Of course. That'd be great if you could break that out. Yes. Okay, uh, President Ford, that concludes my comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Caps And um, Ms. Alvarez, please. Yes, thank you. First of all, thank you to Susan Klein Rothschild. She's such a treasure and such wealth of knowledge. So thank you. We really appreciate your partnership. Thank you to food services. Thank you to admin, the teachers, the principals, everyone who is making this possible. And uh, my takeaway from this presentation is, uh, I think, four points. One, uh, as a district, we are ready to open. We want to open in-person instruction. I mean, there's no doubt about that. I, I want everyone to know that. When will that happen? That's going to happen when there's 25 per 100,000, as it was mentioned for elementary, for junior high and high school is when we're in the red tier. So what's preventing, pre preventing us is the transmission rate. And that's the part where the whole community can help us. You can help us by doing your part, by wearing your mask, being socially distanced, avoiding gatherings, because that this takes a partnership. This takes work from all of us to bring down the cases. And that's when we can bring our students back. That's when we can be in person. The other highlight for me today is listening to Dr. Wagenek. 0.02 infection, 1,395 students. This is very, very encouraging. And this is validated by a recent study that, I that was just published today by CDC, where the infection rate at schools that are, that are in person is very low when the precautions are followed. So for SB Unify, we have to follow the same criteria, the new criteria that the governor has given us, which is the safety plan, right? The Cal OSHA injury prevention plan and the checkoff list, which is really the opening plan. And I'm so happy, I'm so proud and thankful that our team is ready to do that. So the bottom line is infection rate, transmission rate. That's what's keeping us from opening. So I ask all of you who are watching and tell your friends, help us. You can help us by keeping the infection rate down. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, just a few comments and questions for me. Uh, first of all, for Dr. Wagenek, um, I, I would love to sort of along the lines of what Ms. Cap said, I would love to see um, the anonymous reporting number promoted in Parent Square, because we have heard from a number of folks, not only about issues that they might have seen at school, like someone not wearing a mask, but also things they see in the community. And I, I think it would be great to just increase that, um, 
the accountability factor and let our people know that we want to know what's going on in our community and in our schools. So thanks for considering that. And also Dr. Wagenick, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about uh, how we can you know, raise the number of students who are in those small cohorts. We have heard so many positive comments about what's going on in small cohorts to, to hear that a number of our schools have less than 10% of uh, their populations. And I understand that you have a couple reasons why, but is, is there anything more that we can do to increase those numbers while we're still in the purple tier? Well, I appreciate you um, asking that question, I'm gonna, Ms. Ford. I have, I'm gonna take the opportunity first to just jump back to the reporting and say that I hope that anyone in the community who has a concern, they, they certainly we can put the, the state number is not ready or that uh, website address is not there yet, but the county does uh, receive concerns. And so Susan's nodding her head because we are the ones who communicate. But also I'm concerned, uh, I encourage folks to reach out to principals. They don't wanna call the principal contact me or Superintendent Maldonado, because we do wanna know these things. And if there are concerns, we want to fix them. Um, now on to the next question. Um, so we, you know, we don't just, we're not like the emoji. We don't just put our hands up and say, I don't know. So we keep trying and the latest thing that we began doing, because we're really trying to adhere so closely to the guidelines on the small cohorts because safety is essential. However, we will invite, so a principal will invite a group of students to the cohort and a student will come for a couple days and then stop attending. And we're not supposed to be mixing and adding and doing these different things, but what we, uh, and I know Susan will give me feedback on this, but what we've started encouraging principals to do is um, tell the next students, create a wait list and tell students, okay, you're next in line, but we need you to report, um, report in on your iPass symptoms every day so we can watch and see that you've been symptom free, that you're safe, and then we will bring you into a cohort. And so um, that's how we're trying to bring more and more students in if we lose students. Uh, the issue with having more cohorts really is the staffing. It's having, it's, it's having the people um, there to be able to um, hold the cohorts and, and have adults provide oversight. But Dr. Becchio and I added that meeting so that we can keep the flow of hiring going and place those, um, place those newly hired employees where they are most needed. So we're not going to give up, but if others have, have input or thoughts, we are open to them. Yeah, and I, I did want to comment just because it does, um, this is, there's a staffing component to this, but we have placed um, 16 bodies so far at our schools, new hires, and I do have seven that are clearing so we should um, those are to be determined in terms of date of placement but we should have seven more coming on board um, and then the other thing to report and, and by the way that weekly meeting is where we look at where the need is to expand and then we place the new employee at the need to expand the, the most critical need so um, and then the other thing is is january i have to say has been a very large scramble to cover um, folks that are quarantined or have been put on quarantine. And, and so that's been what we've been focused on the last three weeks, just to give the board that information. Thanks. I, I truly appreciate the clarifications. Um, a couple questions for Mr. Rickman now. Also, I'm, I'm very interested in how many uh, hotspots do we have out there? I know only 25 responded to the survey, but how many are out there? We have approximately 1,400 out there being used. Okay. <laughs> I just wish more had responded so that we could get some feedback about how effective they are. Um, I also wanted to know, 
Honestly, is there anything that we can do about the slow Wi-Fi and the drops by Cox? Uh, Superintendent Maldonado and I are going to have a call with Cox uh, possibly later this week or early next week uh, to discuss some of these issues. Thanks. I think it's absolutely essential. We, we've been, that is one thing we've talked about from the start is access. And even as tonight we address equity, I think access needs to be at the top of every list, as does great suggestion by Ms. Caps, the forward thinking and reporting to the, to the public, especially uh, what, what is being planned for the future. We're not just looking backward and reporting on the past, but reporting on um, what's out there for the future. So thanks to all of you for your hard work and also to my sister board members for great questions. We'll continue on now with the regular agenda, taking a, a break in a little while, but not now. And I'd like to go to item number D, the acceptance of donations. And the, we are looking at those donations for January 26, 2021. We're so grateful for the generous do donations we receive from individuals and from organizations. So board members, may I have a motion to accept the donations? Yeah, I move to approve with gratitude the donations for January. I appreciate second. that. And a second? Second. Second. Oh, second. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Munoz, so Ms. Caps and Ms. Munoz, board members all in favor, please signify by raising your hand or saying aye. 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 Excellent. The motion passes unanimously. Let's go on to the consent agenda. And as a reminder to the public, these are items that are generally thought of as routine and don't require much or any discussion. And so before I call for a motion to approve the consent agenda, I wonder if board members or Superintendent Maldonado, are there any items on the consent agenda that require more information or discussion. I do not have any, but I know we have some public comments, President Ford. Oh yes, thank you. No, oh, and I want to, I'm sorry, if this is the right time, I wanted to pull E9. Okay, pulling E9. And uh, any other items that want, uh, that board members would like us to review? With that in mind, let's go forward with the public comments, please, Ms. Trujillo. Thank you, President Ford. We have four uh, public comment on uh, several items on this consent agenda. Uh, Monique DeWitt, Sheridan Rosenberg, Roseanne Crawford, and Audrey Nevsiger. We will start with Monique DeWitt. Hi there, Sandra and board. I, I will try to be efficient. I think I'm just speaking on a couple of them, but I think I'm supposed to just go one by one. Anyway, regarding the special ed contract that it is from an organization in Minneapolis and it's a Zoom. Can you hear me okay? Somebody wave, yeah? Anyway, it's um, a Zoom uh, service and it looks like it's at Dos Pueblos, but it's, it's vague to see, and it's at about $130 an hour, which seems reasonable for a professional speech therapist. I think is to find a local speech therapist, either within our uh, teachers union or just here locally. And the rates will be very similar because these students typically with speech therapy who are, are struggling with literacy, they, won't, they don't do so well with the online format. You know, the one-to-one -one in person and COVID my suggestion is get a local contractor because then um, they can actually do it in person and they can perhaps interface with more people and we're investing locally rather than outsourcing to someone in Minneapolis. So I just would like to um, make that point and piggybacking on Ms. Caps about being proactive. I have many times the worst do struggle with literacy for a variety of reasons. And we are still sadly not doing best practices, which would include automatic testing K through three. This would help us with the learning gap the long picture view. Also teacher training in regards to literacy and identifying students and giving teachers that support. 
is a sore point, but Lucy Calkins, even Lucy says it doesn't work for these students. So could we please try to implement best practices, which is phonemic awareness, and I can send you more, listen to Emily Hanford or Dr. Sally Shaywitz, but the practices I'm telling you about are best practices, because these kids are all going to be it's really, Hi. they were already hurting before. So I'd like to encourage this view. Thank you. Fine, thank you. Um, next we have Sheridan Rosenberg. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to address um, item, I think it's E7, the contract for uh, Stephen Nichols for PR for $50,000 for January through June. Why on earth are you hiring a damage control person? I mean, obviously, I, I looked at a website that he's connected to, Communication Resources for Schools. Really, what the number one thing they do is they assist schools that have high-profile controversies. So you're about to spend $50,000 when you have Cami Barnwell. What exactly is your goal here? Is it to spin this crisis that you're in? Is it to lie? and deceive the public even more than you already have. And Virginia Alvarez, I wanna direct this to you. I took a look at this contract, January to June, $50,000. This is classic bid rigging, classic bid rigging, where that 50K is gonna come up again when this contract expires, won't it? Why on earth are you spending this kind of money when you need to reopen the schools, and this is two thirds of a teacher's salary, we know you're gonna have to, we're gonna have smaller class sizes, which means that you need paraprofessionals. Echoing what Moni said, my God, you should be spending that $50,000 on literacy, on testing, on more staff. And instead, I love it. One of the things he's gonna do with it is reputation management. That's on the front page of the scope of work. I have an idea. Why don't you just tell the truth and don't hide things from parents and the public and rebuild your reputation by rebuilding the trust of the community? Because right now, nobody trusts you and for good reason. And the idea you're going to spend this kind of money on some guy that's going to come in and do damage control is so Hi. interesting. In Virginia, it should really insult you. I hope you don't approve this. Fine. Thank you. Next is Sherrod, um, I'm sorry, Roseanne Crawford. Hi, Roseanne, can you hear me please? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I absolutely echo Ms. Rosenberg's comments. This does not give parents confidence uh, to bring in a, a, an outside PR firm to basically te coach you all on communication. This is ridiculous. And it's a, as a taxpayer, I re seriously regret uh, and, and despise this waste of $50,000 that could be used to put our kids back in school, which is what the parents need and what the community needs. You should be ashamed of yourself. You would be a lot more respected if you were forego this unnecessary expense. And in fact, it's a red flag. It's a blaring red flag. Everyone's talking about it. Uh, we need honesty and transparency. Why don't you start back there and maybe you can gain this community's trust back before they ask all of you who have been reelected to resign from the board and even questioning the new superintendent, thinking she's in on your games. This has to stop. Shame on all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Audrey Nefziger. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm going to repeat because we're recording again. Um, I'm a parent of a Santa Barbara teen girl who's in junior high, 26 year sex crimes prosecutor, a survivor of Dr. George Tyndall, who abused hundreds of women at USC, where I went to law school. And I'm commenting on this PR firm. And I have a real concern I hope you'll address and listen to. The scope of the work for this firm indicates that the board and district plans to use them to defend your failures to prevent and report sexual abuse of students. Mr. Nichols is well known as the CEO of a PR firm that has defended other school districts in nasty sex abuse cases 
like Redlands, one of the most notorious failures of a school district who recently paid 21 million to settle two sex abuse cases. By hiring this PR firm, does Santa Barbara Unified see itself in the same position as Redlands? Why is the board trying to sneak this item through on the consent agenda? $50,000 of public money for six months of work with no debate, no public record of your individual votes. Using tactics like this does keep parents in the dark and it does not build trust with us. Why wouldn't you want the public to know why you're hiring Nichols? Why won't you be transparent about the sexual abuse scandals and lawsuits faced by the district? Wouldn't this money be better spent compensating student survivors who will need years of therapy to deal with their abuse? There must be one brave board member who will pull this item off the consent agenda and give it the light of day it deserves for debate, transparency, a public record of your vote, and public confidence. Transparency is needed. The cover-ups must end. This board needs to concentrate on developing policies and procedures to protect students rather than deflecting blame and hiring PR firms. Thank you. Um, thank you. President Ford, that concludes public comment. Thank you, Ms. Trujillo. And now I'd like to ask Ms. Capps to pose her questions and or comments about E9. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, so uh, E9 has to do with portables, this one at, at Santa, Santa Marcos High School. And as I read it, I just thought um, this uh, portables are such a, such a uh, let's see, focal point in our community because we've had so many of them. I just thought it would be a good opportunity for Mr. Vizzolini to give an update, uh, both just to give a nod to explain what this is about, but more generally an update, a brief update on portables. Again, as someone who went to school in portables and I, and I know with our bond funding, uh, the replacement of portables was something as I went around and talked to different community groups about it in 2016, uh, such support from the community to replace those portables and get kids in actual um, brick and mortar classrooms. So Mr. Vizzolini, I posed my questions to you, if you wouldn't mind addressing them so the public could uh, hear, that'd be wonderful. Thanks. Absolutely. Uh, good evening, board members and Superintendent Maldonado, members of the public. Uh, Mr. Rouse, if you wouldn't mind uh, sharing the slide that we talked about today, that would be great. Um, so board members, what we have here are the questions that were posed. Um, we also added a little fact of information. So the total number of portable classrooms or buildings, I should say, in the district is 160. Uh, the number of portables that were identified for replacement uh, back in, I believe, 2015 during the development of the bond program is 84. And that's based on classrooms that were over 25 years of age at that time. So that was the criteria for replacing those. Uh, one of the questions was how many of them have been replaced? And to date, we have zero. There were a couple of hiccups that we could talk about. Um, we had the full day kindergarten grant program that we put two, two campuses on hold for about a year until we got an answer from the Office of Public School, School Construction that denied our grant applications. So we had to kind of scrap the idea of building kindergarten classrooms and went back to just standard classrooms. So that was the main um, delay there. The next question was how many are in the pipeline to be replaced right now? And that number is 46. Um, if you look below, um, you'll see that the, they're color coded by site. So you can kind of see which of the school sites are included in these numbers. So the 46 classrooms are all the orange or beige -ish color. Um, those are all the ones that are in the pipeline now. We have 20 more that are yet to be placed in the pipeline, but are not too far off from the design. That's what gets them in the pipeline, just so the board knows. That's when we hire an architect and we get started working with the school staff on the design of the actual project. Um, the last question was, how many of them did we drop um, for an alternate uh, type of construction? And that number is 18. And if you look below, you can see that there, it's only three sites actually where that occurred. Uh, two of them were memor memorandums of understanding with the board for both Autolante and the Dos Pueblos CTE Pavilion project where we traded some um, portables for um, like a land use trade for Autolante and for um, augmented funds from the DP CTE program. 
um, and that McKinley to remove uh, many of the, the current board might not have been on when this decision was made, but um, the most of the portables at McKinley are still fairly decent. And the decision was made to use that funding to um, remodel and renovate the upstairs portion of the main building at McKinley, which has been out of use for 20 years. So we have we are going to be adding an elevator to that uh, main building that gives the, the school access to the second story. So they will have about a 2,300 square foot maker space is actually under construction right now. So that would, those are the three where that occurred. So uh, I think that gives you a pretty good um, explanation of where we are with our, pro with our portable programs. Of the 46 that you see, a lot of those are gonna be happening in the next year. Um, we've got a bunch of them at Adams and at Harding and Monroe that are all really, that are lined up really closely right now. We're waiting for a, a guaranteed maximum price for Adams as we speak. Um, Monroe's gonna follow shortly. Um, Harding is in the Division of State Architect approval process. So um, we're pretty far along, especially in the elementary district. And then we also have, um, based on this consent item is the, uh, the design at San Marcos High School is also in, the, in this 46 and there's 10 classrooms there. So I think that answers those questions. If there's anything else I can answer for you, I'd be happy to do that. That's it for me, because those are my questions. Actually, I should give credit where credit is due. Uh, Mr. Ed Heron, former board member, flagged this for me. So uh, thanks to him for always keeping an eye out. And Mr. Vizzolini, thank you. And of course, if, my, if any board members have any questions, I'm good, but thank you. Thanks, I believe Ms. Munoz has a question. Oh, yes, um, thank you, Mr. Vizzolini. Um, I had a question about the replacement of the portables, you know, and was just wanting to know um, how it, if you could explain about how the budget would be the same to, um, for construction versus replacing the portables, if that's my understanding of it. Okay, maybe I should clarify, we're not replacing any portables with new portables. In all cases, portable classrooms are being removed and permanent classrooms are being constructed. Oh, I'm sorry. That's what I meant. I'm sorry. I should have explained myself more clear. Um, and from what I understand, constructing, you know, the new classrooms will cost the same. So I was just wondering if, it, you know, how that would work. Um, I actually, I don't think accurate? it is one. It isn't one for one. Um, in today's market, it's probably closer to 0.75 to one. So in most of these cases, what we're doing is working with the school sites and you know, part of the process of doing construction on a site is to have to move uh, programs out of an area to renovate a space. And so one of the things that that exercise helps with is it helps us look at the utilization of a school. And we find that in most cases right now, except for a couple of our really um, impacted elementary schools, we have more space at our schools than people think we do. And so it, you know, absorbing like losing one classroom out of the total of the intended um, portables to be replaced is oftentimes not as big a challenge as you would think. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Board members, I also have asked Ms. Maldonado to clarify the Nichols contract, which I definitely support. Ms. Maldonado? Thank you, uh, Board President. And I do wanna say that the intent of this contract is to improve our communication and crisis communication is just one aspect of it. The other part of it is the leadership development in our executive cabinet, our principals and others. We learned from the stakeholder input when I was hired to be superintendent for Santa Barbara Unified, the building that trust, accountability and transparency with our community was a key outcome. And that is the intention. We also want to be clear that uh, when we speak about public relations, it is not meant to uh, hide or lie. It is actually quite the opposite. It is meant to ensure that we are providing all of the information in a factual way so that the public and others can learn more about the great work we're doing in Santa Barbara Unified. In fact, even tonight, it was mentioned that we are not doing enough work in talking about some of the great things that are happening because we have been in a very much reactive mode. Additionally, board members, LCAP goal two talks about improving our communication and outreach to parents in a way that really meets them where they're at in their language and their culture. 
We want to make sure that our principals are equipped to do that. And uh, lastly, board members, I just want to say that in developing our communication strategy, we appreciate Ms. Kami Barnwell, and she is key member of our staff, but it is one person for many, many messages that are happening across our district. And I believe that as we develop all our leaders to improve in this area, the intent of the contract is to the contractors is to work themselves out of working with us. And that's why it's a six month contract. Thank you, Ms. Maldonado. Ms. Caps. I just want to uh, weigh in and support, as a, this is what I do for a living as well, and the fact that uh, the way that you just explained it was wonderful because it's important to know, and it's been astounding, the volume of communication that has come out of this district uh, in, during the pandemic, but also since you started uh, Superintendent Maldonado and, and kudos to Cami Barnwell, the fact that it's a one person team of a budget of $160 million and 21 schools and the, the, the breadth of what we're doing, the videos, the parent squares, the fact sheets, the frequently asked questions. These are just the ones that I interact with. There's so much that goes on behind the scenes uh, to get the word out and work with different campuses and different schools. So it's a ton of volume and I can say that from experience. So I appreciate actually the, the speakers for raising this so that we can have the opportunity to uh, explain the value of this communication, especially in a time of crisis that you have to over communicate and it's really a challenge to do. It's really a bandwidth issue. And so I'm glad we're adding to bandwidth. Thanks. Thanks. And Ms. Sims Moten. Yeah, I, I would just echo those comments and I certainly support that. I, I know that I myself as a board, a board member really want to be able to communicate clearly, openly and transparently and this will help us continue to do that and get, get those things out. I think it's an important move in terms of where we're trying to go and improve um, as a district to make sure that people understand where we're coming, what we're doing and where we're, where, and where we're going. So I appreciate, the, I appreciate you, Super Maldonado, bringing it to us. Ms. Alvarez, thank you. Yes, and um, we did a cost to value analysis. Uh, Ms. Maldonado and I had a conversation about this and the benefit that it's going to bring. Uh, it's not only a professional development for all of the admin team, not only at the district office, but at the site as well. There's a large number of employees that will benefit from this service. But the number one thing is that we will improve our communication to the parents, to the students, to our community, which is a, one, of our, one of our primary goals. So uh, even though we did not, even though it was in the consent agenda, there were a lot of questions already posed and the information that was required was provided. So thank you, Ms. Maldonado, for doing that. Thank you. Appreciate that. And Ms. Munoz. Yes, also I would like to, you know, appreciate the explanation by um, our superintendent Maldonado. Thank you, Hilda. And for my sister board members, I, you know, I don't want to repeat what they have said. I certainly agree. And as Ms. Cap said, you know, there is so much that goes on and communicating, you know, is so important. Outreach to all of our communities, all the diversity. Um, that we are faced with, you know, um, today, I know that there was a uh, interview with a Spanish speaking radio station and just making sure that all our uh, community is, is there's transparency, the communication um, and such. And I, you know, very much in support. Thank you. Thanks. I would just like to add in addition to kudos to Ms. Barnwell, kudos to Ms. Maldonado. This is a perfect example of why we hired her because she is proactive. It was her idea to improve communications in the district. And we also hired her because the very last thing that she will do is hide and spin. And so uh, I, I also completely support this part of the consent agenda. So with that in mind, board members, I wonder if I may have a motion to approve the consent agenda for today. So moved. Thank you, Ms. sims Moten, And a second? A second. Thank you, Ms. Munoz. And so all in favor of approving the consent agenda, please signify by saying aye and raising your hand. Aye. 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 Consent agenda passes unanimously. 
And with that, we are going to take a break. This board has been going three hours straight. Uh, so we will take a 10 minute break. It is 8.49 and so let's make it 11 and be back at nine sharp. Thank you. And now we're on to the action items on our agenda. And uh, the first three are all uh, items that are a pleasure for the board to approve in the belief that these students have met all the requirements that are necessary for re-entry into our schools. And so with the first one, I'd like to entertain a motion um, to take action on the petition for readmission of an expelled student. And this is case number 201920-14. Is there a motion? I so move. Thank second. you. And a second? Sorry, could you say if you're a second? Yes, Wendy. Thank, Thank you. you. All, all in favor, <laughs> signify by saying aye or raising your hand. Aye. 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 This motion passes unanimously. The second item, is there a motion for readmission of an expelled student, case number 201920-34? I so move. Thank you, and a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Sims Moten and Ms. Munoz. All in favor, signify by saying aye or raising your hand. Aye. Aye. Wonderful, the motion passes unanimously. And our third petition for readmission of an expelled student. This is case number 201920-38. Is there a motion? I so I'll move. <laughs> yes. Oh, I so move. Thank you, Ms. Munoz. And a second. Second. Thank you, Ms. Sims Moten. So all in favor, please signify by saying aye or raising your hand. Aye. Aye. Excellent, this motion now passes unanimously. President Ford? Yes. Can I just add a comment with regards to this, this section? I just so happy mm. to see that when our students work really hard to get back and to get on track. And so I just want to express that every time wholeheartedly, I uh, want to appreciate and acknowledge their work to getting back as well as the parents who support them there and administrators as well. So thank you. Thank you so much. And now on to item number four, Ms. Maldonado. Thank you, Board President Ford. I, I would like to pull this item. There were some questions that were raised that need us to con uh, conduct some more research and we'd like to bring this back to a future meeting. It sounds like a great idea. Thank you so much. And we look forward to, do you think it will be the next meeting on February 9th? We hope to do that, if not the 23rd, and I'll make sure to inform the board of that. Thank you so much. Okay. so. The next two are adoptions of board resolutions that the board has had an opportunity to be very involved in and also to review extensively. Uh, so the first one is on affirming the district's commitment to justice through equity, equity driven policies, procedures and practices. And to introduce this resolution, I would like to call on Ms. Alvarez and Ms. Sims Moton. Thank you. It was such a pleasure to work along Wendy uh, in this important work for the district. And um, I'd like to share with you, with the board members and the public, a little bit about our process. It was uh, a very collaborative process. Ms. Larios Horton and Ms. Maldonado gave us a draft. And Wendy and I had a Zoom call. We did research on our own. We did research together. And then we, of course, taking into consideration the composition of our district and our goal, then we put together this resolution that is in front of you. We welcome your feedback. Please tell us what you like, what you think we missed, and any other suggestions that you might have. Also, I do want to point out the why of this resolution. It is directly tied to the why of the district. And the why of the district, the mission, is to educate kids to focus on student outcomes. And to this end, this resolution will help us to realign our financial and human resources to achieve this mission. 
And in addition to that, there's one phrase that uh, Wendy and I talked about when we were working on this resolution. And this really resonates with me when it says, achieving equity is when students' identity does not predetermine their success in school. And that's what we are about. That's what Santa Barbara Unified is about. In addition to that, I would like for Ms. Maldonado to give us some ideas after the board's discussion about what action plan, what will the action plan look like to implement this commitment? So Wendy, what are your thoughts? Thank you. It was also a pleasure to work alongside you. I think we learned a lot about, you know, the equity piece and, and your perspective. And I also want to thank Super, uh, Supervisor Maldonado and Maria, Maria <laughs> Horton um, for having the draft ready for us really in a, good, uh, in a good template that we could really work from and work efficiently to get it to the board today. And so I am, I am very pleased to bring this draft and look forward to the comments from my sister board members. But I, I would just add on just one more thing in, in the fact that equity is a fundamental principle that must be part of what we do, right? It gives us the guidelines, it, it gives us the, the base and, and the foundation as we go through all of our systems, when we look through our budget, when we look through uh, communication to that. Are we communicating in an equitable way? Are, what are we doing? Is it really getting at the heart, as, as Ms. Alvaro said, the education of our students? And so when we start to look at things through an equitable lens, then we're going to be looking at everyone and all their needs. And that way, we are really supporting them in a, uh, an equitable way and never questioning, did we forget someone? Because if you're looking at equity, you're looking across the district and making sure that everyone is included in that. And that becomes the basis of the conversation even though one may not be necessary at this or that table, but because our cultural is built in inequity, then all people will be, and their, their points of view will be um, at the table. And if it's not, we'll know that too. So thank you so much. Again, I, I had the pleasure and honor working with Ms. Alvarez and, and we're proud to present this to the board for discussion. Thank you so much. First of all, Ms. Trujillo, are there any public comments on this resolution? Thank you, President For Yes, we have 15 public comment on this um, item. I will start naming five at a time so they can get ready. So I'll start with Daniel Gonzalez, Lee Horn Tep, Ana Cepeda, Moni Duet, and Barbara Parme. Um, Daniel Gonzalez. Uh, hello, school board members. Hopefully you all can hear me. Uh, my name is Daniel Gonzalez. I'm the organizing di director for Future uh, Leaders of America, and I work with many of the youth in, in your district. I'm here today to support resolution number 2020-21-22 uh, that, that SBUSD is adopting, which affirms the district's uh, commitment to justice and equity. Um, as an organizer in our community, uh, I have seen firsthand many of the challenges our youth are currently facing and which have been exacerbated due to distance learning. Um, distance learning has highlighted many inequalities in our education system, and no more is it shown than with the amount of Fs our youth have received in this midterm report reports. Um, our students' education system needs a complete overhaul. And that is what I believe this new resolution is working on addressing, addressing the lack of support and resources needed from the most marginalized students in our district with an emphasis on equity rather than equality, as well as taking a hard look at what our, where our teachers are lacking in instruction and providing them with the support or training they require in order to give our youth the best education possible. Although this is the first step in addressing many of the issues in our district, I believe it is the right step needed to ensure our youth are truly receiving um, the education they deserve. So I urge all board members to support this important resolution and to vote to pass it immediately. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Laren Tep. Hi. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Lehern, and I work with youth in Santa Barbara through Future Leaders of America. I'm here today in support of the resolution affirming the district's commitment to justice through equity driven policies. The resolution addresses a myriad of issues that faces the school district today, including the academic achievement gap. The pandemic highlighted that the disparities of students were receiving F's in their midterm progress reports 
were predominantly Latinx. This displays value and demonstrates the strong need for an equity-driven approach towards education. The resolution aims to address the unique needs of students from diverse backgrounds by dismantling barriers to success and providing additional support systems desperately needed by our youth. Furthermore, representation is important. While students of color make up a majority of the student body, only 28% of the educators are teachers of color. The underrepresentation amongst staff and faculty and furthermore in stakeholder meetings have shown itself in our low outcome. If we want to create a college going culture for all, we have to start with an equity driven approach and focus our resources on the students who need it the most. That's why I'm here in support of the passage of this resolution. It commits to ensuring equity is at the forefront of all decisions made by the district. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Ana Cepeda. Hello, uh, my name is Ana Cepeda and I am in favor and support for the passing of resolution number 2020-21-22. And um, I have been born and raised here in Santa Barbara County and I'm here as a parent. I'm here as somebody whose child is heavenly struggling um, in school. And I want to make sure that she and others like her are able to be provided the support that they need. Um, I've seen from the Santa Barbara's um, Unified School District, the mislabeling of Latinx students at 3.443 times the rate than their white peers while with having learning disabilities. My child um, is really struggling and I know that we need more support. We need more support from our communities. We need more support from our school district and we need more support for our teachers to be able to provide that the resources and the cultural awareness um, that our children need. Um, and because of these reasons, I am in support of this and I really hope and encourage that you pass this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next we have Moni DeWitt. Ms. DeWitt, can you hear us? Well, I am glad that the board is looking at, hello, I'm sorry, am I, am I on? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I'm glad you're looking at equity and even from the previous speakers, you know, we all look at the achievement gap, but one of the biggest sources of that gap is the one in five with learning differences. So they learn the foster youth. Those are, have the most dismal scores everywhere, anywhere. And the reason why they do is because they're not getting taught in the way that they learn. And certainly I've heard Superintendent Maldonado speak to people of different learning styles. And yet this district clings to an ineffective model Really care about equity, you got to work literacy into it and best practices, just cultural proficiency and making people feel like they belong and doing other things is not enough. You're missing something so crucial. And I want to say neurodiversity is being completely ignored. Something that 20% 20, 20 of your students deal with. And that's why you have like 4% People reading at La Cuesta, you know, they haven't been dealt with before. Secondly, because um, some little glitch in uh, scheduling, um, the, uh, I like the idea of the student on the board, but it doesn't go far enough. Civil rights law firm in San Francisco and encourage you all to go there. You will find that you're shorting them. They should be full members. They should be seeing everything that you see. That's gonna make us as a district stronger. And I would, I would really encourage that we, we revisit our student board and let them see what goes on behind closed doors because equity is, do the people of means only get the special ed settlements? And, and we need to find out, we need to be more transparent. And lastly, the family engagement, it's not happening. Community needs to be on you know, community members as part of LCAP need to be allowed to participate. Last week, I asked for a written how I, I can participate. I got no response. I actually very rarely get any response. And I'd like to know how I can participate in meta, anything involving learning differences and in these time. policies. 
And I really would like a written response. Thank you. Thank you. By law, I deserve one. Thank you. Next, we have Barbara Parmay. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, you can go ahead. Okay. I support this resolution. But first, I am forced to address the erroneous statements by Superintendent Maldonado concerning ethnic studies now. How can we trust you when you put out inaccurate statements? Our country is suffering from lies in the public space. Now your statements have been repeated by the white supremacists and segregationists who have spoken several times. I do not have time to counter all these lies. Instead, I wish to support this resolution on equity practices. I do have a few questions though. Can this resolution change the behavior of those hiring and firing our teachers? Why do teachers of color represent only 28% of all teachers when the student body is 64% youth of color? It's good to change the policies and procedures, but if we do not identify and change the actual practices of administrators, teachers, counselors, and principals who support discriminatory conduct, then their decisions will continue to be rationalized and excused. The proof of discrimination and white supremacy is in the numbers. When you increase the number of qualified teachers of color and add culturally relevant instruction, including more ethnic studies curriculum, the numbers will reflect a greater effort towards educational equity. In summary, please enforce accountability, change the numbers. Thank you all for your work. Thank you. Our next five speakers are Gloria Soto, Jenny Sperling, Lauren Quedet, Chelsea Lancaster, Eva Catalan. And I'll start with Gloria Soto. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Good evening. Um, my name is Gloria Soto, Director of Public Affairs for Planned Parenthood California Central Coast. I'm calling in support of the resolution affirming the district's commitment to justice through equity driving practices. Planned Parenthood promotes the ability of all individuals to lead fulfilled lives, build healthy families, and make informed decisions through high quality health services, education, and advocacy. We firmly believe that affordability and accessibility to quality education has a significant impact on health outcomes. The current COVID-19 crisis has shuttered schools across the state School and district leaders developed and rolled out distance learning plans at unprecedented speeds. Despite the well-intentioned efforts of educators at all levels, distance learning experiences have varied dramatically among students. In recent, it was recently reported that at Santa Barbara Unified, 85% of high school students who earned three or more Fs on their midterm progress report were Latinx. It is clear that distance learning has disproportionately negative impacts on students who were already the most underserved by the systems in place. The resolution in front of you ensures that resources are allocated based on the unique needs of students from diverse backgrounds. When addressing equity, representation also matters. Show, studies show that having diverse teachers, diverse leadership, and diverse school cultures create higher, expect, higher expectations stronger communities and better educational outcomes for students. Despite that students of color represent 64% of the student body at SBUSD, only 28% of teachers are of color. This resolution will address the issue of representation and amplify diverse perspectives and give a voice to tra traditionally underrepresented groups within the school district. Education equity is health equity. We at Planned Parenthood firmly believe that all people from all diverse backgrounds deserve access to high quality education and health services. Your education, like your health, is your future, no matter who you are or where you come from, which is why we are in support of this important re resolution and ask that it be passed tonight. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next we have Jenny Sperling. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi all, I'm a community member here in SB and a PhD student in the School of Education at UCSB. I'm here today in support of moving this resolution forward and supporting the district's commitment to justice through equity-driven practices. 
As a grad student whose research centers on equitable learning opportunities for all students, I know that K through 20 schooling continues to marginalize Latinx, Black, Indigenous, and other communities of color. Santa Barbara is no different. Our district and schools continue to underserve Latinx and Black youth by pathologizing students as disabled, mislabeling them as at risk, and pushing them out of traditional school spaces into alternative places. There's nothing accidental about the displacement of Latinx students in our district into special education classes. With Latinx families almost four times as likely than their white peers to be identified as having learning disabilities, we need to know as a community who is identifying students in schools in this way and how it's actually happening in detail. We know that the educators, staff, faculty, and admin in our district are predominantly white, so we can get to a more general who on our own, but the how requires explanation. What does this process even look like? What sorts of standardized or made by and for middle upper class white English mainstream speakers, curriculum and assessment practices lead to such misidentification and mislabeling practices of Latinx youth? Are they formalized surveys? Are they standardized tests? Are they merely based on teachers' assumptions and even classroom observations? We deserve transparency so we can ensure the resolution's commitment to educational justice and not throw around the word equity without really understanding what that means. Thank you for all your work. Thank you. Next we have Lauren Quedet. Ms. Quedet, can you hear us? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Sorry, I was Excuse me. Um, yes, hello, my name is Lauren Kwande. I am a community member, future parent, and past student of this district. And I am speaking today in support of this resolution. Um, I really believe this resolution is needed to demonstrate this district's commitment to social justice and equity now. 26 years ago, uh, when I first became a student in this district, it only took a few days as a white junior high student to look around and see what I would continue to see for the next six years gate and AP classrooms with only a handful of students of color and an overwhelmingly white teaching staff. I have no memory of having a teacher of color in those six years, although I very much hope that my memory fails me. All these years later, despite study after study, scientifically stating the importance of representation and other equity-based practices for all students, and we have seen such little change, I look forward to watching you all vote in favor of this resolution that will demonstrate the district's commitment to social justice by providing more resources to students who come from unserved communities, having a staff that is representative of the student body and promoting a college going culture. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Chelsea Lancaster. Good evening. Uh, my name is Chelsea Lancaster and I come to y'all as a parent, um, an educator at the community college system and a community organizer um, in solidarity with Future Leaders of America, Healing Justice and other groups. Um, I wanna name first and foremost that equity is not bringing this item three hours after the white supremacist parents in our district have front loaded um, the dialogue three hours earlier. Um, this presents a huge barrier and a challenge for those that are parenting um, that are doing mother work in the community, that are organizing, that are working. Um, I also want to name that um, representation is important, representation matters, and we need to be hiring not just teachers and administrators of color, but teachers and administrators of consciousness. Our students deserve to have mirrors in the classroom, people that understand them and understand their, their rich histories and contributions to our communities, not from a deficit perspective, not from a perspective that sees our students of colors, uh, students of color as lesser than, but it sees the beautiful, rich um, contributions that they have made uh, to our community. And I'm sorry, I'm tired at this point because I've had a very long day. But I also want to name that intentions matter. As the people that have front loaded this entire conversation um, with their anti-blackness, with their, with their blatant racism that we know to be true, um, intentions matter. So as, as we have this conversation, I want to name that people are naming um, people, uh, folks with learning disabilities. Um, we also come from that perspective that we need to dismantle ableism uh, in, our, in our, um, our system and that our students of color are being misdiagnosed 
as having learning disabilities because we are not meeting them where they're at. We're not teaching them in a way that we, they can see themselves represented in the materials. And this is where ethnic studies comes in. I wanna name, first of all, just to correct the record, ethnic studies has not, nor has it ever been a nonprofit organization. Hi. Ethnic studies is a grassroots. Thank you. Our next speaker is Eva Catalan. Hi, my name is Eva Catalan and I'm the Youth Wellness Coalition Manager with Future Leaders of America. And I'm here today in support of the resolution affirmation that the district's commitment to justice through equity driven practices. Um, I read many articles that the district mislabels Latinx students at a 3.3 um, times the rate of their white peers with having learning disabilities. To point out to the point where the state flagged the district to address this issue. Reading, reading articles was not the first time I heard the mislabeling was happening in, in the school district. I witnessed an emotional mother who expressed that her child was mislabeled with having a learning disability and she did not comprehend why her child was in special education classes. And after many battles with the school, her child was able to finally test out of the special education their junior year. Because of this delay, her child had missed out on the opportunity to fulfill all of their A through G requirements, thus making it more difficult to apply to a four-year university. The resolution commits to ensuring that there is not an over-representation of students of color in special education, and that we take equity over equality approach to help all students gain academic success. Because of this, I am in support of this important resolution and urge you that it is adopted immediately. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next and last five speakers are Olivia Carranza, Cristina Ceballos, Jennifer Hale, Cindy Cruz, and Karen McBride. We'll begin with Olivia Carranza. Señora Carranza, ¿nos puede escuchar? Uh, sí, buenas noches. ¿Me escucha? Sí, puede empezar. Okay. Muchas gracias. Uh, buenas noches a todos los miembros del concilio. Eh, mi nombre es Olivia Carranza. Soy una, una mamá de tres, tres, tres niñas y también soy la parent organizer con futuros líderes de América. Eh, yo estoy a favor de la... Actually, I'm going to change it to English. I'm sorry. Is, mm -hmm. is that okay? Yes, that's fine. Go ahead. Muchas gracias. Uh, I'm in favor of the educational equity resolution. And I will talk about three different points that I wanna share with you. Uh, and this resolution will help too. Um, as a mother, I have my oldest daughter is 23 years old today. And when she was in elementary school and junior high and high school, I was never informed of A through G classes, never in my life. Uh, I was very involved in a lot of committees, ELAC, DLAC, PTA, uh, uh, LCAP and many other ones. However, my voice, I didn't know that then, but my voice was never really heard. Uh, it was always the principal, the one that would take control of everything, will decide everything and will write everything out. It was really sad, really sad that I would take so much time of my life, of my work life, of my kids life, to be in these committees to improve my life, the life of my students, my life of my kids. However, it was really, really hard. Now I understand why, because we don't have a lot of counselors, a lot of uh, principals, a lot of teachers, a lot of therapists that work in schools that represent me, someone like me, someone with my color, but not only my color, so somebody that represents my, my needs, somebody that represents what my students need somebody that get to know us, somebody that has human kind, kindness. It's really important that we pass a resolution like this that shows that we need to help equity, that we need to support our stu students with what they really, really need. Time. Thank you. The next speaker is Cristina Ceballos. Um, since she's not... Um, Responding, I'm going to circle back um, and go with Jennifer Hale. Hello. Hi, can you hear me now? Um, 
¿Me yes. escucha? ¿Me oh. escucha? Jennifer, can I get back to you? ¿Me escucha? Sí, puede, puede pesar. Sí, ok, perdón. Buenas noches, mi nombre es Cristina Ceballos. Soy una mamá de, una, de un estudiante de San Marcos High School. Estoy a favor de la resolución de, de justicia y equidad a la distribución de prácticas y recursos a los estudiantes basado a sus necesidades únicas. Como casi no hay trabajadores en las escuelas como consejeros y maestros a que parecen como parecen tanto importante como a mí y a mi hija, pero sobre todo tengan en la simpatía de entre, entrenar y mi, mientras calificados para tener y mejorar las, las necesidades de, nos, de las únicas y cada estudiante de las escuelas. Gracias por este apoyo, esta resolución y pido que sea implementado Gracias por su tiempo. Gracias. Next we have Jennifer Hale. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, great. Thanks, good evening board. I am a parent of two kids in the district. I very much appreciate the resolution that's being brought forward tonight and want to voice my strong support. We hear the terms equity and diversity quite often, but without action, they are simply words. So it's my hope that this resolution is the first step towards concrete actions. Equity just doesn't happen on its own. It takes a commitment. It takes resolutions like this one. It takes a community that holds elected officials accountable to promises made. And let's remember that the system of education was built on racist ideologies and practices. So we must all be anti-racist and proactively work to dismantle racist structures in order to reform them. So while implementing a resolution is a great first step, it's changing behaviors that will have a lasting impact. It is proven that representation in the classroom matters. Administrators must be held accountable for hiring teachers and building a full ethnic studies department that reflects and serves our student population. We have thousands of students in our district being disproportionately impacted by this pandemic. And while it's difficult right now for all of our kids, including my own white kids, students of color are facing the greatest obstacles as evidenced by the Ds and Fs. We must listen to their needs and provide additional resources to these students who are struggling far beyond their Zoom screens. Again, I see this resolution as a foundation for equity and a great start. I sincerely hope that the building blocks placed upon it going forward are anti-racist actions. After the very harmful public comments, racist comments that we heard throughout this meeting, I even more strongly encourage everyone at SB Unified to fully embrace this resolution. And more importantly, hold yourselves accountable to just and equitable decisions and behavior. Thank you so much for your work. Thank you. Next we have Cindy Cruz. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Cindy Cruz, and I'm the Director of Education for Planned Parenthood California Central Coast. Um, and today I'm calling to support the resolution affirming the district's commitment to justice through equity driving practices. Um, as my colleague, colleague mentioned earlier, Planned Parenthood promotes the ability of all individuals to lead fulfilled lives build healthy families and make informed decisions through high quality health services, education and advocacy. We firmly believe that affordability and accessibility to quality education has significant impact on health outcomes. As a first generation college student and as a daughter of immigrants, I know firsthand how difficult it can be to navigate the school systems. Those barriers are exacerbated when, a, when as a student, you do not have teachers and staff around you that look like you and can and that can understand your unique situation. I am fortunate that I have been able to obtain my graduate degree, but that would not have been possible without the support of teachers who understood me and who provided me with the resources that I needed to succeed. One teacher in particular comes to mind. She was a Latina like me. She spoke Spanish like me and she had a similar background as mine. She was the person that inspired me to seek higher education because I felt that if she could do it, I could do it. 
And after all, she was like me. And that was something that I was not used to at that point. Representation is important as, as folks have said tonight, having culturally relevant tools and resources are important. And this is especially true for students of color whose parents are oftentimes learning how to navigate these systems and who may not have the tools and resources needed to help their kids break down these barriers. So this resolution will be the first step towards building more equitable schools in Santa Barbara. Because of this, I am in support of this resolution and I ask that it be passed tonight. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our last speaker is Karen McBride. Hi again, Karen McBride, president of Santa Barbara Teachers Association. Um, I'm speaking tonight in support of this resolution for justice through equity driven policies. Uh, our work as educators intersects with our role as advocates for social justice in our school communities. And it's fair to say that almost every educator in this district sees and knows students of color who have been denied opportunities, have been tracked into programs that limit their choices or programs that have missed the mark at engaging students through culturally relevant, responsive, creative, and empowering content. I know that this is changing, having seen it in small increments in my own teaching experiences. And board members have highlighted a good example of a relevant and responsive event tonight when they shared about the college night uh, the, that was given in Spanish um, recently. But there needs to be so much more and it needs to be in our daily practice. It needs to be in our training, in our hiring, in our spirit of engagement. There's always room for reflection, improving and changing, and there's always room for greater inclusion of students and their families, as well as staff. And Santa Barbara Teachers Association stands ready to be thought partners in this work. Um, three phrases that stand out to me in this resolution are personalized learning models, an equity-based funding model, and advancing equity through hiring practices. These are so critical to district plans for, every, for moving forward with this equity plan. And I wanna say, um, you know, every time I hear Olivia Carranza speak, uh, you know, she worked with me at um, La Colina Junior High as a parent. Um, she was a parent, I was a teacher. And when I hear her speak and she tells me that she, didn't get information that was critical and so many other parents um, knew about, I, I just think something is broken here because that woman is so involved in every aspect of her children's education. So we need to fix that and teachers need the tools to help that happen. So thank you for hearing me and thank you for passing this resolution tonight. Thank you. And President Ford, that concludes public comment on this item. Thanks very much, Ms. Trujillo. And now I'd like to give both Ms. Munoz and Ms. Caps an opportunity to weigh in on this resolution. Ms. Munoz. Well, thank you, um, President Ford. Um, I, as you know, as my background as a community advocate, I could not be more supportive. And I really appreciate all the community support of the resolution and am hearing all the um, the points that they have. And as, you know, Karen McBride just pointed out the involvement of folks like, you know, Olivia Carranza and her own experience with her daughters. I know that she spends many hours with parents um, providing education to them about, the, about preparing their um, children for college and careers and also, you know, ongoing support um, equity and social justice must be kept in mind on a daily basis as, you know, whether we're board members, whether we're community members, um, teachers in the classroom, you know, in food services, et cetera, right? At every level on, um, on a daily basis in order for us to close the achievement gap. Um, I know myself and my daughters also going through the school system have mentors that they look to. I know that at Dos Pueblos High School, for example, Mr. Cruz was one of the teachers that my daughters looked up to. And I was, you know, thrilled to meet and still, you know, keep in touch with him at this point because our students saw and see the reflection of their own 
he walked in and you had the music going and you knew that he could relate to you and reach out to you. And I know that, you know, as um, Karen McBride said, that our teachers want to be there for our students. And we want more of our students to grow up and become teachers and have their own success if that's what they choose to do. And, um, and our community can certainly benefit from that. Um, so I want to see also the continued partnership with our, um, you know, future leaders, with our um, folks that make public comment, you know, all, everyone, um, regardless of their viewpoint, the more, you know, that we know and involve them and have that transparency, the more we can benefit. So, you know, I am very much in favor of, of this resolution. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Caps. Thank you, sorry. Uh, yeah, I just echo what my colleague, Ms. Munoz said, and so many of the speakers, the advocates, I wanna thank uh, board members, uh, Ms. Moten and Alvarez for the work that went into this, I'm sure in partnership with um, community advocates and, and staff, and, and of course, Superintendent Maldonado and, and President Ford. Um, but words matter and resolutions are important. Uh, because they state our values. We state our values constantly on this board and in this district. And uh, and it's clear that you have five board members who are committed to equity, but it, we, we can't just stop with saying that commitment. We have to continually, continually, I know this as an advocate, um, you have to continually beat the drum and do the work and keep pushing because the inertia and the injustice and all of the, the way that systems have been uh, ground into us that have systemic racism and all of the barriers that exist. So I appreciate this because it isn't just words. There is real action in this resolution. And I was so impressed when I saw it uh, on Friday when the agenda came out, I knew it was coming, but I would just was uh, so relieved to see that it wasn't just sort of a statement of values, but actually real directive. And in particular, I was trying to pull it up, which is uh, the, the be it further resolved after item five, which really gets into hiring practices, job descriptions, very technical things that of course we as a board feel like, okay, we've been sending this signal or I can speak for myself. I've been sending this signal that I, that this is why I ran and why I'm here and why I'm doing this work. But it comes down to decisions that are made throughout the day by the staff, not just the superintendent, but teachers, school staff on a regular basis, who you hire, how you, how you treat students. I, again, as a product of this school system, I saw the inherent justice, injustices that were so present when I was a kid a long time ago and they persist, it's so persistent. So to see the power of this resolution makes me proud to support it, but also humbled to know how much work continues. And that's why I'm relieved and grateful to the advocates that stayed. Yes, wait far too long tonight uh, that we're at 945, uh, but, but we need the community partnerships that we have to keep us accountable, to keep pushing uh, to keep advocating. And so I, I'm grateful to all of you and happy to support this resolution. Thanks. Thank you. I too am so happy to see this in front of us. I felt very emotional in reading this important board resolution. And I sincerely thank uh, both Ms. Sims Moten and Ms. Alvarez for leading the effort along with the expert counsel and assistance of Ms. Larios Horton and Ms. Maldonado. I love a few things in particular, which I want to call out because they address the importance of collaboration and shared responsibility. One bullet point was to provide a nurturing barrier-free environment where all students have the opportunity to benefit equally. Another was accelerate efforts and build internal capacity to do this. Another was access to personalize learning opportunities. These have all been mentioned by others. And finally, disrupt predictable patterns of student achievement. And I guess uh, because it's our one job really as a board, it's in there to direct the superintendent to ensure this equity policy drives all decision-making. So yes, I too support this 100%. 
So with these comments, is there a motion to approve the adoption of board resolution number 2021-22, affirming the district's commitment to justice through equity-driven policies, procedures, and practices? I shall move. Thank you. And is there a second? Sorry, I can't see. Second. I don't know if Wendy wants to. Wendy, sort of, sort of, sort of, sort of she'd like to. Wendy, second. All in favor. Aye. <laughs> All yes. in favor signify aye or raising your hand joyfully. This, this motion passes unanimously. The second uh, resolution for tonight is adoption of board resolution number 2020-21. 23 in honor of Black History Month. And I would uh, like to call on Ms. Sims Moten, our expert and, uh, and her ability to express these um, desires so perfectly to introduce this resolution. Mute myself. Thank you, President Ford. And I, I just on the heels of the equity um, resolution, um, how important this is coming in behind that and tying to that. And I just also too want to share my appreciation for the comments um, from the activists and supporters and sharing their personal stories with us and how important equity is with regards to that, identifying, seeing someone else like they are. And I know there are other difficult conversations and comments to hear, but I would rather hear them out on the front as opposed to what you're thinking silently, right? So then we have the opportunity to talk and, 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 and have a discussion about one, one perspective or another. So those are difficult things to hear, but I would rather hear them because as Kathy Bates would say, your silent thoughts give me pause. So keep saying that, but we are sitting at and, and really espousing our values through this equity statement, probably more than we've done in a long time. It really clearly states where this board is going because it starts, I used to say it starts from the top down, but it really starts from the bottom up and not in a negative way, but for the people who are most closely impacted by the policies and procedures that we make in this district. So hearing that, looking at all of those things, I, I, um, I will now um, go forth in the Black History Month and I am always honored to, to bring this forth to celebrate not only the struggles, not only to bring in the awareness of the struggles, but to celebrate the triumphs of, a folks, of folks of history that has not been told. It's often forgotten or very slighted with regards to that. And I, I just, you know, I get to get uh, emotional about that. And, and until we get a new American history curriculum that includes all Americans, we're going to keep doing this and celebrating those cultures that are not on the forefront to talk about made this America. So I, I, I just want to appreciate the fact that that this is still here. I want to thank Carter G. Woodson, who said we need to have this. You know, it was just a week just to bring up the awareness and now we, we've expanded to a month. I want to see it every day in terms of that. As I said, my hope is to get to an America that includes it all. And so we don't have to segregate it out or give a, a moment or a week to something. It's about all Americans who've contributed and also recognizing the struggles as well as the triumphs. And so I, I present with you and I've had the, the you know, good fortune and, and, and appreciative work with Ms. Ford uh, to bring this um, forth again uh, with regards to Black History Month and, and just recognizing the things that continue to go on. And there's often little bits, little, little parts of Black history that are unknown. And, it, and, it, and it's, it's, it's like surprising sometimes, even to myself, having, you know, being African American, don't know all the history um, that has gone on, you know, that allows me to, to be in this pace, this place, this pace and space right now. So I, I, I would just like to say, um, so just a couple of questions that maybe perhaps you didn't know, a couple of statements. So did you know that in first published in 1936, Negro Motorist Green Book, it was a green book, a comprehensive guide for black, uh, black travelers to, to travel safely where they could lay their heads after a long day. You actually had to have a green book to let you safely know where you could stay as you traveled. This stopped after 30 years in 1966, two years after the Civil Rights Act was passed. Did you also know that Phyllis Wheatley was the first African-American to publish a book of poetry, poems on various subjects, religious and moral in 1773. 
She was born in Gambia and sold to the Wheatley family in Boston where she was seven years old. She was eventually emancipated shortly after her book was released. So there's lots of information. It is not just focused on February. I urge you to go and look it up. I want you to be inspired by this resolution to say, I want to go know more about that. I want to know how that is. Because when we get to know each other's culture, we get to walk in those shoes for just a moment to truly understand. And I think that we have to continue uh, to do that. And I think when we don't um, spread that throughout, we miss an incredible opportunity to educate not only ourselves, not only folks who we may be missing in that, in, in that, in that, in the history that is America. But it's time for us to change. We're starting to do that. I'm, I'm so proud to be on this board that continues to keep pushing, pushing that effort about equality, equality, equity, whatever we need to do with regards to that. Um, hearing from our community across the community, we have to do, we have to make some change. And so I know last year we we adopted Black uh, Black Lives Matter. That continues to be as that was part of the equity resolution, and we'll continue to to honor that. But I just want to say that. We're, we're never going to forget about the Black Lives Matter. It's going to be a part of our everyday. It's not just going to be focused in February. It's not just to be focused in this week. It's going to be a whole throughout the year. Lives matter. So let's make sure that we continue to focus on that. And that will hold ourselves accountable when we look back at our resolution that we just passed unanimously and very inspiringly. So, so I would just like to be at this at the end that um, the last thing that really spoke to me in terms of whereas although Black History Month is a separate month, it's important to remember that Black history is not something other than American history. Literature could be one of the best ways to help students relate to people of different backgrounds or historical circumstances other than their own. So thank you and I invite your, your comments and, and thoughts and edits if, if necessary, but I appreciate the opportunity to bring this again before the board. Oh, thank you, Ms. Sims Moten. I knew that you would be inspiring. So now it's time to hear from members of the board and I will turn to Ms. Munoz first. Thank you, Ms. Sims Moten for presenting this resolution and thank you, um, President Ford. Um, as, as, gosh, I mean, <laughs> as Ms. Sims Moten has, you know, so well expressed, um, this is so, it just, it's part of our history. The stu our students need to be able to learn about Black history, the Black history of the community in Santa Barbara um, as we were growing up here, um, being, you know, also like as, as some, <laughs> as you were saying, it's just, sorry, it's even hard to express it. Just, you know, my, um, we would go visit my grandmother in, um, in Texas and it was very apparent back in the early 60s into the 70s where, you know, where people could go, right? Talk about segregation. You'd go try to get some breakfast and, you know, there was obviously some separation there. And it's, you know, long overdue. We need to do this 24-7, seven days a week, have it present um, and appreciate the Black history and the Black Americans that have made a, a difference in our country. Um, so thank you, Ms. Sims Moten. And um, just, you know, I certainly um, thank you and my sister board members who I hope will be in um, support of this. Thank you. <laughs> Great. And Ms. Caps? Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, I'm struck by the timing of this Black History Month resolution and, and the month itself with just uh, less than a week ago, uh, the um, inauguration of our new vice president. <laughs> uh, talk about history, shattering all of the million adjectives we can say. So uh, it just gives this month, and you're right, this day and this hours, all the more momentum and uh, meaning with with what has happened here in this country with such pride and the signal that that sends to our students not just our black students but all of us and not just our uh female female identifying students but everyone hopefully so um i have of course in full support i did just want to phrase you you uh, ask the question because miss sims moton you did raise it uh, but we did get a request from santa barbara 
Raza educators to just reference uh, Black Lives Matter resolution, I believe. If And I just wondered if you, uh, as the author of this resolution, were um, open to doing so. It seemed it seemed important to do from my perspective when we received their email. So that would be my one request if we could uh, honor their request, if that makes sense. Or Ms. Uh, President Ford, if you had a point on that. Ms. Caps, the resolution does reference Oh, I'm sorry. Black Lives Matter. What it doesn't reference is the uh, the black. I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the name of it, but the black. Uh, oh, what is it, Wendy? Uh, about the week, um, maybe Miss Lovey. What is it called? The Black Lives Matter Week. The resolution that we passed last year. I think that was the request was to just. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Just harken back to that, I believe. Yes, so, well, yeah. that's in that is in the resolution. I think okay. they wanted to specifically point out the week of February third. Miss Laurius Horton, yes. help me here. I don't have it right. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So next week, uh, February first through February fifth, is the Black Lives Matter School Week of Action. Okay. Um, yes. Um, let me just also add, it is, um, we did talk about that in um, the, I'm trying to figure out where in the third paragraph, I believe, we talked about the unified strong commitment to Black Lives Matter and Black Youth of San Resolution, June 23rd, 2020. I also want to um, to also remember when we actually drafted the Black History Month last year, and we really talked about focusing on a week, we had a lot of pushback from the community with only being focused on just a week. And so what we were doing here is that it's a focus all month as the activities that we do throughout the, you know, throughout the month, the teachers are free to look at that, focus on that for a week, but a whole month is not just focusing on the week. And we were really trying to hear from the whole community and there's a really a lot of pushback to just and it felt in, in fact to be direct in fact they felt offensive offensive um that only giving one week about black history and so we wanted to make sure it was more broad uh in the month but it certainly can be part of the weeks of those months so there's four weeks of that month so they can celebrate you know can be celebrated as per the teachers and the curriculum dictates thank you Thank you. And Ms. Alvarez. Thank you, Ms. Sims Moten. Thank you, President Ford, for your work in this wonderful resolution. And uh, it's such a great reminder, Ms. Sims Moten. We definitely need to keep in mind to do a self analysis to see how we, as a board, how are we helping and what are we doing to move forward uh, the commitments and the equity resolution, as well as. Uh, celebrating the achievements of many greats out there regardless. It shouldn't be just a week or a day, but it should be part of our history, part of our culture and part of our dialogue. So thank you for all your work and I 100% support this resolution. Wonderful. Um, I just have a couple cents to add that uh, first of all, this resolution is so uplifting to me and I'm really grateful that Ms. Maldonado and I had a chance to provide some input, but this really was all Ms. Sims Moten with terrific assistance from Ms. Larios Horton. Uh, two statements exemplify its importance to me uh, in particular, and I want to share them. One was that Black History Month provides an opportunity to highlight the unique contributions of the African American community that have too long been overlooked. There are so many stories that have yet to be told about the history of Black America. Black History Month inspires us to search beyond the typical and to seek out the extraordinary. And I 100% also support this resolution because it states a commitment to foster in our students a greater understanding of the roles African Americans have played throughout history in our nation and helping all students understand their responsibilities in protecting and preserving the humanity of all people. So with these comments, I want, would love to know if there is a motion to approve the adoption of board resolution number 2020-21-23 in honor of Black History Month. I wholeheartedly <laughs> want to uh, make that um, 
motion. And, and I would just add to this, you know, as we talked about the equity and also the Black History Month, that there, there's a lot of work that this is just the start of our work and we have to continue to do work to make sure that, you know, that we're not get complacent where we are. And someone told me that you might get weary in the work, but never get weary of the work. And so I just say that out to with regards to the work we're doing here. Thank you so much. Is there a second? A second. I second. Okay, Ms. Caps, you were first, but everybody wants to second this. <laughs> so, please, uh, board members, um, please uh, vote to approve this resolution and signify by saying aye or raising your hand. Aye. 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 And this motion passes proudly and unanimously. Thank you so much. That takes us on to uh, number two, which is presentation of Santa Barbara Unified School District's annual financial reports for the period ending June 30th, 2020, and the required communication letters. I'll turn this to Ms. Jette. This is all you and your team. Thank you, President Ford, board members, and superintendent. Yes, I'd like to introduce our auditing partner, Shiloh Grosby from Ide Bailey. She's here to present our 2019-20 financial and bond audits. Uh, Ms. Grosby has been a partner with Santa Barbara Unified for five years. And you may remember that um, at, um, Ide Bailey uh, merged with VTD about two years ago. But before I turn it over to Shiloh, I wanted to point out that this audit was delayed due to COVID. It usually is completed by December 15th. And due to that delay, we were unable to meet with our uh, board audit committee prior to this meeting. So I wanna assure all of you that we will be scheduling that meeting with those board members. And with that, I will turn it over to Shiloh Grosby. Thank you, Meg. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, you're good. All right, great. Well, thank you for having me here tonight. And oh man, was all of that a tough act to follow. So I know how interested we all are in the financial piece, especially when we deal with so many other great topics for the evening. But as usual, I will go through my summary of the audit for the year. And I'm always happy then to take your questions or comments uh, at the end of my presentation. I'll start with the district's audit uh, for the financial statements as of June 30, 2020. That uh, always starts with our opinion, which is your page one, once you get past your table of contents of the report, our independent auditor's report. I believe everybody has a copy of it in front of them. I have a copy of it in front of me. So I will, I'll just recap that for you and maybe refer you to a few, uh, a couple other pages that I think are of most interest to you. So our independent auditors report, you know, the goal of that is for us to provide you with an opinion as to whether or not the financial statements as presented are materially stated based on our audit. We do that through our audit procedures, risk assessment, sampling techniques. And, you know, tonight we're providing you with an unmodified opinion. If you've heard me talk about what an unmodified opinion is before, you know that that is the highest level of assurance we can provide you in an audit, it is a clean opinion. And so it means that as presented here tonight, we do believe the financial statements are materially stated based on our audit. Now that said, there are other components to the uh, report complete package that we like to bring to your attention. I will turn your attention specifically before I go into the other reports that are embedded in this document uh, to page 88. And the only reason I want to bring you to this page is because, you know, it, 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 it often comes to me uh, questions about, hey, if, as a board member, when I've got this document in front of me, you know, what should I look at? Well, this is a very high level page for you. If, if you're trying to get an idea as to big picture overall, where are we at? I, I, I think page 88 does that. It, it's a three year analysis of where you've been and one year looking forward at where we're going. Now, with that said, that one year looking forward budget for 2020 was based on your adopted budget from, you know, way back when in June of some time. So you're in a very different place today than you were then. So take that into consideration when you're looking at that information. But it is just a very high level summary, kind of recaps real nicely for you. Um, just some general information 
that I think is important for the board to look at. And that I will take you now to page 103, which then goes over in summary form the other reports that we provide you within this audit. The first of which is our report on internal control over the financial reporting. So our goal here is not providing you an opinion on internal controls. However, during our audit, we do an assessment of controls. And if anything comes to our attention that warrants communication to you because we've identified it as a significant deficiency or even a material weakness in your internal controls, we would do so within the internal control over financial reporting report. And so tonight we do not have any material weaknesses or significant deficiencies to report to you. So that internal control report is a clean report. The next one is under federal awards. So we are mandated by both federal and state, which are the next two reports that I'll cover. We're mandated at both levels to audit specific federal and state programs. And the federal report is providing you with an opinion on in compliance, as well as um, uh, an opinion on internal controls. And so again, we use the terminology significant deficiency, material weakness, and when we're talking about a clean report, we use the terminology unmodified. And so that's a clean report with no compliance issues or internal control issues to know. Last but not least, state compliance. So I'm going to repeat myself on this one. You know, we had, we had um, an unmodified opinion on your state programs and we do look at a significant number of programs that are, are mandated again. And, that was, and we didn't have any findings related to compliance on your state program. The next page, the next pages that follow that are really if we did have findings to report that were material um, weaknesses or significant deficiencies, they would follow in those next few pages. And then, you know, sometimes we come across other things that we, you know, do in the course of our audit. For example, it's become pretty customary in a lot of what we do to audit, you know, ASBs or other um, um, processes that maybe. We don't think those types of findings would ever rise to the level of a significant deficiency or material weakness, but they are things that do come to our attention. And so when we do come across those types of, of things, we do like to bring those to management's attention and they are included in uh, the report as well, starting on page 108. And then the last but not least with respect to the district report, you know, there's a letter that we provide to you separately as the board, it's our communication letter to you. This is really an important letter for us because what our goal is with this letter is to provide you a little bit of information that takes you outside of the report itself. You know, there's some things that you can't really get a grasp of uh, by looking at the report. A couple of the examples I like to give, you know, we always have to evaluate our independence when it comes to performing um, the audit for the school district. So we wanna let you know that we've evaluated our independence and we are independent. Um, we want to let you know if we've had any difficulties in completing the audit. Now, I think everybody might agree with me in the business office that um, COVID definitely created challenges this year, but that's not the type of difficulties we're referring to. Um, you know, we, we're looking at things such as, you know, did management respond to all of our requests? Were we able to look at everything that we needed to look at? You know, were there any scope limitations? And, and so with that said, we didn't have any difficulties completing the audit. Um, we did have to work in a remote environment, but you are fortunately set up where you do a lot remotely anyways. And so that probably contributed to our ability to still work through it despite, um, you know, the challenges that COVID brought. But so for that, actually, you know, we are very thankful for, for the fact that management was able to um, really still accommodate us in, in, in this remote environment in order for us to be able to get the audit still completed. Um, but no difficulties. Um, no disagreements with management, and, and overall, um, you know, we're just happy to be able to present this report to you. And with that, I suppose any questions, I'm I'm open. And I know there's a couple more reports, but I think we'll do one at a time. Meg, or yes, that that's fine. Okay. That's the big one, the big financial audit. Okay. So with that, I'd like to ask board members if they have specific questions. Uh, I want to thank uh, both of you, also Lacey, for 
this presentation. I, I think it was very, very clear. And I'm sure we have a few questions, but thank goodness it was a very clear report and the audit is clean. So please, uh, how about Ms. Munoz? Do you have any questions or comments? Um, yes, thank you. The well, the one comment I had was about the the schools, the um, ASB um, accounts, in terms of having them, you know, keep track of their finances, um, both on a regular basis and then also looking at, you know, how there there was mention here, which I appreciated, of how the clubs were using, you know, monies that. Um, of other clubs and so forth, but just managing that better. Um, and it looks like it has happened in the past. I remember it from last year. So I just wondered, you know, just kind of um, how that could be improved. So is that question for me specifically, or was that addressed for management or just want to make sure that I don't step on toes in responding to that? Right. I believe ma management. Um, <laughs> Well, I was, uh, okay. yes, so thanks for that, um, board member Munoz. Um, we, we highly recommend and sometimes even require the sites uh, business managers to go to a FICMAT training for ASB accounts, that's Associated Student Body Accounts, um, to learn how to do that, to learn how to, you know, you know, make timely deposits and keep track of the funds. We have had um, several change in, um, in staffing in those three areas, especially in the three high school areas, which is the largest ASB accounts. You have to understand also that they have multiple funds going, um, like fundraisers, football, basketball, cheer, all of those types of fundraisers so um, it's a difficult position, and um, but we are trying to get them to follow the guidelines and to help them. In fact, um, our internal auditor is writing up procedures on almost every item for a reference for them to, to make sure that um, things are accounted for properly. But Shiloh, in your experience in other districts, have you offered in, I mean, do you have anything that you can offer above what we've been doing um, to help with these? Um, I we wish I could say above, um, you know, we do have a variety of training mechanisms as well. Um, you know, the only other thing, and then once, it, once again, it, it really end up, it, it really does end up coming down to what level of um, commitment the district wants to invest maybe in resources in centralizing that activity to, to where you know that that activity is being handled by a true accountant, maybe somebody at the district office. I mean, it would almost be, you know, that willingness to invest in another um, position to who has a, a better understanding of, of what's going on, you know, from our experience, these are primarily folks who aren't really accountants by nature, and um, and so they don't they understand that 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 there's a need to account for money, but there's a lot more to it than just counting you know your dollars and pennies and making sure that that they all balance. And so, you know, there's not a lot of districts out there who go the route of saying, hey, we have the funds to invest in another position that can then essentially centralize and control all of that activity. Um, but I do think that's 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 probably the only thing that be uh, uh, above and beyond just training and an ongoing commitment to, you know, not accepting findings and, and holding people accountable. That's really the next step. Um, and that's just a tough one. You know, you have to just decide uh, for, as a board and, and as a management of, of the district, if, if that's where you want to go with it. So when you like to, uh, uh, think, sorry, Meg, let me just jump in here. Uh, I, I, Wholeheartedly agree with you, Shiloh. I want to thank you, first of all, in my experience doing compliance work in my previous district, I will say that we will look at some of the systems and processes that we currently have for doing check-ins, uh, oversight, and being very clear of our expectations 
for anybody who is going to be handling any fiscal uh, matters in schools so that we know that they are properly trained on an annual basis and that we do spot checking of their work. And so I'd like to uh, let the board know that we will, Meg and I will get together to develop some of these systems and processes and um, ensure that we basically provide the training, especially when there are changes. So it's up to us to keep track of when those changes happen and ensure that people have the right skills and that we have the right systems and balance, the checks and balances system in place as management. I appreciate that. Um, thank you. Thank you. And Ms. sims Moten, please. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, that was one of my questions. It's been one of my questions since being on this board, um, how difficult this is. But I, I do think we need to get a better handle on that. And, you know, and how do we work to make sure that we do? Because the, the, the fact is, it's in our audit. You know, it's, it's, it, 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 it's, uh, it may be a small amount. It's almost like out of sight, out of mind. But it could, be, it could become a potential issue here because the attention is not really being paid on it or we keep giving passes about you're untrained or you're not able to. It's hitting this audit saying there's an issue. And this isn't a one-time observation. It has been it's ongoing. So let's, let's figure out how best um, to do that. And I know that, you know, centralizing uh, may be an option, but we also want to make sure that our schools have the independence to do what they need to do and the flexibility to do so. However, that certainly comes with a level of responsibility and expectation. And I think, um, I know Meg, you and everybody's been trying to work on what's um, a consistent, you know, coming in and, and recognizing what needs to happen because this is a, a position that turns over. So what do we, you know, take into account this position that turns over? So what do we need to make sure that we have in place? And I would like to see, so from this audit, it's almost like that's ground zero. So if you're negative 124, whatever we're saying, then where are we, where are we making that zero? Starting with, we're going to get this down and get it even, and, and you're the person that's taking care of and needs the steps. So maybe you, starting from start, some starting point to do that, because this, this, they're probably, people are probably taking things over that has been histor historically done and not taken care of. So if we can get down to we're starting with zero, we're all balanced, nobody's negative, everybody's getting things on time, then you can kind of start to see as you're spot checking along the way, are they following that? Because you were at zero, so there shouldn't be issues unless then you can figure out what the issues are, if that's a training issue or there's someone that's just not, should not be handling the money. Because what I wouldn't want to see is the fact that the flexibility that the schools have and the hard work that they do be taken away because of this process. So the more that we're able to do that, and I know that's something that you're working on, but I think it's something we need to conclude. This is now five years, and I don't know how many years it was before I came on. So just something to think about. Um, and then I, I had one more question. So um, Charlotte, on page 89, um, where it's saying that including this audit report, we only have Santa Barbara Charter. Are we waiting on Adelante and Peabody, or do they not? Are they not typically included? No, they're not typically included. Since you're not the authorizing entity, they are not within the scope of, of our audit specifically. But you know, you are the authorizer for Santa Barbara Charter. And so therefore we actually do their audit as well. And it's encompassed within this report. So help me understand that, you know, when we come to not necessarily you, Shallow, but maybe Megan and or Hilda. So when we have uh, Peabody and Adelante, we're approving their charter, right? Under Santa Barbara yes. Unified. So how we not have some liability for that? So here's um, the Santa Barbara charter is within our financial system. It's in a fund nine. So they are part, so Shiloh, uh, Ed, Ed, um, Ed Bailey looks at their entire audit, which means that they are part of it. Peabody and Adelante are not in our financial system. They do their independent audits. And I believe that I Bailey does Peabody's and Adelante's also. So um, they are being audited. They just aren't in our audit. In, as part of our financials. Right. The and, they, and they submit their audits to the state. And they also are probably required to submit their audits to whoever authorized their charter. That's which, right. We get them and we review them. Yeah. OK. And then I have one last question. Um, you know, we deal with audits at the county in my program in, in particular. So we have a finance committee which goes over our audits and different things. And what our auditors have done in the past is they will send out 
you know, communication to our financial, uh, to our fiscal committee of, do, of their understanding of our fiscal process. Do you do that? Because I don't remember getting one as a board member or even as an audit committee. Is that something that you do? Um, I think I need to understand a little more maybe what the intent of that is. So it sounds to me like maybe their approach is that they're reaching out to you in to, to get an understanding of your role and, and the internal control structure. So we do a lot of that same, you know, obtain an understanding, we just do it differently. So we do it through, you know, discussions. Um, I think I've sat down with you in the past and said, hey, let's talk about some things. Let me know what some of your concerns are. So it's a different method of maybe some similar um, goals of, of which is to obtain an understanding of what is the district doing? What does the oversight look like? Who's involved and, and, and what's everybody's role? So we still do it. We just maybe do it in a different fashion. Okay, I, I just wanted to, that's for the public to know that as that is one of our responsibilities mm -hmm. uh, as a board to have fiduciary, you know, good fiduciary responsibility. And so what that include that includes knowing what's going on and understanding that. So I, I appreciate that, that, that yeah. we do have that process. I and I would, I would just add, and this is, you know, for, for, for Meg, as well as for that, the, the oversight committee, if there is ever a desire for, you know, a separate or different presentation at a different level of detail or at any point with that committee from, from me specifically, that's something I'm always willing to do as well. So we, you know, calendar one of your scheduled uh, meetings for that and, and we can have, you know, at your desire, whatever those um, topics are that want to be discussed, if it's to dive deeper into the report or, or anything like that. It's something that we're always willing to do. Okay, much appreciated. And I just want to say that I, I do appreciate the audit, the cleanness of the audits, but just those little things that sometimes we just think are insignificant become big things and I just want us to keep an eye on it. Okay. Thanks, Ms. Caps. I'm good, thank you. Thanks for the conversation. Thanks, Ms. Alvarez. Uh, yes, I want to say thank you to Meg and her team. I know the work that this takes behind the scenes, so thank you. And I do have some comments and some suggestions and some aspirations that I like to see by next year. Um, and specifically page 108 and 109. <clears throat> I suggest that we, somebody at the district, maybe Ms. Maldonado, give a FICMAT, Fiscal Crisis Management mm -hmm. Assistant Team, a phone call and arrange for a training of all the principals that oversee the, their office managers or athletic, athletic directors or whomever is in charge of this specific ASV accounts and that a training is held and also that we put in place checks and balances so that this doesn't come to us next year once again. Um, I mean, if you look on page 108, it says here that in two schools, they had balances that were unaccounted for in one school was over $76,000. That's pretty significant. In addition to that, for the audit for Shiloh, what I would like to see is here in your summary, it talks about the observations and what you recommend, but it's not asking for the district's response. In my experience, anytime that there's a recommendation from an auditor, we are required to give a response. So I would like to see that, what is the response? How are we going to remedy that oversight? Uh, so those are two things I like to see. I would also like to see that we, that the district make, make mandatory this trainings for the ASB bookkeepers, for their supervisors, I don't particularly see, see that this person needs to have a, an accounting degree or a CPA, but they need training. And the training, I think uh, we are responsible for that training. So I wanna make sure that we are providing that adequate training. So thank you. We will do that. We'll, we'll take those recommendations and make them happen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And my questions were, uh, addressed by other board members. And so I am good. That concludes this particular item. Again, thank you to Shiloh. Thank you to Ms. Chate and the entire team.
We're on now to number three, which is Network Refresh Bond Project Update with Mr. Rickman. Thanks, President Ford. Good evening again, uh, Superintendent Maldonado and board members. Uh, Brian, can we please bring up my presentation? As he's doing that, I just wanna say, I know the hour's late, so I'm going to try to be as brief as possible. Um, as Brian's bringing it up, I'm just gonna go ahead and, and start. Um, when I was preparing for this, uh, this presentation, I, I was surprised to look back and see that when I originally uh, presented the, the, this to the board, it was in December of 2019 although it feels like it was yesterday to me. Um, and at the time I presented it, I, I told the board that uh, we were hoping to be done with it this past June, but of course COVID hit and that has set us back. Uh, next slide, please. So when I initially uh, presented to the board, I explained that, um, that there had originally been a budget for of six million dollars uh, for this project, uh, and we're going to come in just over three million. The reason for the large discrepancy is because when we budgeted for this project, we didn't uh, account for the fact that we may be able to use E-rate funding, and so we did a lot of work to purchase almost a hundred percent of the equipment for this project using E-rate funds where we get a 60% uh, discount uh, because of our, our uh, E-rate ratio. Next slide, please. Just to, uh, no pun intended, refresh the uh, board's memory about the goals of our refresh is to focus on security, performance, dependability, density, and sustainability. Um, I can answer questions about these later if, if you want. I, I wanna point out one in particular is the sustainability piece. Um, we are going to reduce the number of switches that we have, uh, lowering our uh, need for power quite substantially actually. And we are putting in smart APs that monitor themselves, their power usage and turn themselves off uh, when they're not being used. Uh, next slide, please. So we have a extremely large and sophisticated network. In fact, I would venture to say other than UCSB, we probably have the largest um, network in Santa Barbara County. Uh, at any one time, we have 10,000 users and 20,000 devices on our network. Next slide, please. To support those users, we have uh, 440 switches and uh, 1,050 access points. Um, and after this refresh, next slide, please. Uh, we're gonna have 310 switches and 1,100 access points. So we're decreasing the number of switches while increasing our access points. Again, the number of switches, decreasing the number of switches will help us with our power consumption and increasing the number of access points, we're going back and we're filling in outdoor areas um, that we missed originally. Uh, every classroom has at least one access point. We have multiple uh, access points outside, but there were some areas that we missed that we're gonna be covering uh, with this refresh. Next slide, please. So the refresh is, is happening in, stage, in phases and phases might actually be a bit of a misnomer because some of them are happening at the same time. Um, to save time, I'm not gonna go, I'm not gonna read this slide to you. This was given to you guys in, in preparation for the board meeting. So if you have questions about this, I, I'd be happy to, to answer them. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we've been working with Cox to try to uh, speed up the when the completion dates on these Cox circuit upgrades uh, will be done, but I want to inform the board that we've been able to make some changes on our firewall and routing 
that some of the issues that we were seeing with performance at our elementary sites are not occurring as often as they had been. Next slide, please. And before I take questions, I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that this is a huge project that's being done primarily by three people in our district. So I want to recognize uh, Jesus Orozco and Dylan Walker who are, who are part of our ETS team. And we have a great partnership with our facilities department and uh, Jared Gents is the person in facilities that has um, been helping us. So without that crew, uh, none of this would be, would be getting done. So now, uh, Brian, you can uh, stop sharing and I'm happy to answer questions. Oh, thank you, Mr. Rickman uh, for this report and also thank you for being succinct. Uh, the board has seen it, and I think we might have already uh, had an opportunity to ask you questions beforehand, but I will open it up to board members um, to see if they have further comments or questions. Ms. Munoz, do you? Uh, no, I don't. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Ms. sims Moten, how about you? Nope, not at this time. Thank you. And Ms. Caps. Uh, just appreciation. Thanks for the information. And obviously this is at most of importance right now. So thank you, Todd. Of course. How about Ms. Alvarez? Thank you. Uh, no, thank you, Mr. Rickman, for the of, report. Of course. And with that, I have no questions either. I, I totally agree with my board members that this is very important and appreciate this work and appreciate the team that you called out very much. So that does it for tonight from IT. So we'll go on to the final uh, board item for tonight. And I must apologize. I really, I really tried hard to have this meeting end earlier than now, uh, but I know that this team will also try its, uh, try its best to keep this, this report also succinct. So with that, I will turn it over to Ms. Maldonado, LCAP. Thank you. Actually, we have a first read of Title I Family Oh, Meeting. I'm sorry, that's right. I'll cap the board president board. We have two public comments, I believe, for these items. That's right. Thank you. Ms. Larios, go ahead. No, okay. Well, yeah. go, sorry, do you want to do the public comments first? No, well, I think so because there's so, it's so late. Yes. Is this okay. Yes. Thanks. Yes, we have uh, President Ford. We have one public comment on this, Miss uh, Moni Duet. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, guys. I'm sorry. Uh, I know it's late, and I also am not at my studio, and so my um, connection may be a little uh, off and on. So I, I'm really, uh, this is a really important issue to me is uh, parent engagement or community engagement. And, um, you know, I am all about moving forward, but I have personally had several traumatic experiences with community engagement, high level ranking people in our who actually wanted me to just go away. And um, certainly I understand people see things through different lenses, but, um, I'm dyslexic. I'm also someone, the very first person in my family born in this country. I was raised Dutch. I um, adjusted as a dyslexic to learning how to read with my primary language being a different language. So although all that sounds sort of Eurocentric, I have a lot of empathy for English language learners, emerging bilingual learners, and yet, um, when I try to share my experience and my insights, um, I've actually been hostily shown the door. And, you know, I get that. I'm ready to move on. But um, a big part of your current policy does not even invite community engagement. And I see community engagement as vital as our newspapers are to our political climate or our different forces. It's a neutral force. And it says, hey, you forgot about something or hey, you missed this, or hey, you're violating this. It's a check and balance. And our system has gotten to be to the point where it, um, 
I mean, I've actually been met with hostility, but I'm resilient. I have a lot of grit. I have dyslexia. I've gone through a lot worse than the amount of rebuff and insults that I have personally faced. But your community engagement isn't even listed. I hope I'm not blanking out here. So, you know, it doesn't matter why not, but it should be because you know, my voice, I'm not saying I'm impeccable or, you know, you don't want to edit me, that's fine. But, uh, you know, I actually have a lens that none of you have looked through. And I, frankly, it's even a gift, maybe not a gift you feel ready to receive. But Hi. I personally have met undocumented workers. I've met kids who are in the 11th grade reading at the fifth grade. I know this inside and out and I've been at it for decades. I'm so please, community engagement, don't throw us under the bus and come back to me. Somebody ask, ask me, stay with me, you know, don't, don't just pretend I'm not there. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, she's hung up. I know she was going to comment on the next, uh, next item also, but I guess we can call her back for that. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Larios Horton, please. Thank you, Board President Ford, uh, board members, and Superintendent Maldonado. This evening, I bring to you the school level parent and family engagement policies for three of our schools, Adams, La Cumbre, and San Marcos High School, that did require updating per our most recent, recent federal program review. The principals of uh, those schools are with us this evening in the event you have any questions at the end of this brief presentation. Now I ask Brian to please um, bring up the slide deck. Thank you. Um, Title I funding is intended to support specifically our students who are economically disadvantaged in special education and English learners. Next slide. As part of Title I federal funding, our schools are required to set aside funds specifically in support of family engagement. Their family engagement policies require stakeholder input as stipulated by ed code. Next slide, please. To help us understand how the school level policy is situated within the broader family engagement policies, you will see that our district policy, which you approved earlier this evening, drives our school level parent and family engagement policies represented in the lower left box of this diagram. Next slide, please. School level policies presented uh, to you are based on these five goals mandated by the California Department of Education. And as noted here on this slide, and they include positive parent family engagement to support academic efforts, strategies to assist with learning at home, effective and consistent communication, professional learning for teachers and administrators on effective communication with parents and parent programs in support of academic support. Uh, parents and families have been partners in the development of the policies um, presented to you today and as stipulated by Ed Code. Um, I also want to add that our schools and staff are committed to working as partners with families and believe in the value of such partnerships for improving student learning. They're also committed to continuing to build their understanding that families need to view themselves as partners in their children's education. We also know that for true family school partnerships to exist, we need to continue to build adult capacity and invest further in communication and engagement that is conscientious about middle-class assumptions related to household resources, family traditions, cultural practices, and who the central figure, figures are in each student's life. In other words, our, uh, our work with families must be responsive to our families' ways of being and funds of knowledge. Um, these policies will come back to you on consent on February 9th. And now in the event that you may have questions for our principals, they are on hand. And I did let them know that because it is so late, they did not have to turn on their video. So um, thank <laughs> you. And I will um, open it up to questions. Thank you so much. Um, I will go through our board members to see if anyone would like to comment or have a question. And uh, I appreciate this, uh, this effort. Ms. Munoz, please. 
Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Maria Larios Horton, and thank you also to the principals for staying up with us this evening. Um, no questions. Thank you. And um, Ms. Sims Moulton, do you have any questions or comments? Just a quick comment. I echo Ms. Munoz's comments. Thank you very much for principal staying with us and Ms. Loris Horton helping us through this and, uh, and making a very comprehensive and succinct presentation. Thank you so much. And how about you, Ms. Caps? Yeah, I just uh, thank you, Maria. Like this is it, such, a, I, I, I regret that this is at 1040. This is often the way this happens, but this is so important. And I, I spoke with a, a or I connected with a, a, a parent who wasn't so happy today. And she said that she'd already talked to you and I just know how hard you work. And so I guess in that spirit, given the fact that the board is really the community voice uh, with your principals on the phone, if they want to join by audio, I just want to ask, how can we help? How can we, you're stepping up your efforts. You can, we can feel it. How can we join you in that effort? And you don't have to answer that, but I just am offering that because um, we've seen through COVID. Uh, I could just tell you my experience as a board member, my interaction with parents has probably quadrupled which is a good thing, uh, but it's, it reflects how intense uh, the climate is right now. And so I just want to say, you know, if there's things that we can be doing, I, I for one, am hungry for that uh, because we're sort of, we're, we're out there, we're, we're, we're working with you in concert and maybe connecting a little bit more or helping you is really the point. Thanks, Ms. Caps. And Ms. Alvarez. Sorry, I would just speak to that, Laura. This is Kelly Fresh. Um, oh, good. Thank that you. Absolutely. We have found, I'm sure all three of us, but I know I have found that during COVID, it's been um, been extremely important to be more available and, and the parents have access to all forms of communication and time with the administration and time with the teachers and time to be able to ask questions. And, and I know that... Um, it's difficult for everyone, but we've actually seen an increase in our parent meetings. And a lot of that is because of our fam family engagement unit and the interpretation that we're offering. So families that can stay in their home and participate in our, our meetings, whether they're principal's coffees or PTA or ELAC or even family nights, um, the increase has been a positive of, of side of their engagement opportunities. Thank you, Kelly Fresh. I appreciate that. But again, if if there's a way that the board can just support, just uh, please don't please don't hesitate. Well, thank you. I think we all not get in the way. That's also the point too. So <laughs> I think um, it's obvious that you're all approachable and that you do your best to answer all the questions. And I also commend Maria for making herself available. Yeah. Wonderful. Thanks, Ms. Alvarez. I, I have no specific questions. I reviewed the engagement um, documents and I had some questions and Ms. Uh, Larios Horton answered them. So I appreciate that. I do want to uh, thank the principals for their work and also to echo what Ms. Cap said. We are here to help you when we're back to being able to be in person. Please keep me in mind. I'm happy to come in and help with this engagement and whatever I can do to help. So thank you. Thanks, Ms. Alvarez. Well, uh, I do have a question for the principals um, since you know I do think it's the best job in the world and you guys are doing great at it. So I'd like to ask Kelly and Kip and who's our third? Bradley. Bradley. Yes, Bradley, oh, but is Bradley still here? Yes, he is. Oh, good. I'd like to ask all three of you, what part of your plans for parent communication and engagement are you most proud of? Kip? That's an excellent question. Um, thank you, board president and board members and superintendent uh, for giving us this opportunity to share good work that all of my principal colleagues are doing to engage the community um, one of the things that I am so thankful for Maria and her unit is uh, helping me understand the importance of language access. So one of the things that I started to do is this quick video to accompany my um, parent square message. And I always have an interpreter 
um, we couldn't do necessarily simultaneous interpretation. So we do, um, you know, I speak and then my interpreter speaks and then that uh, the interpreter person happens to be one of my staff members. And I just didn't think much of it. And I offered it as a way for them to see me and hear me. And when we uh, had ELAC meeting, parents actually said that was one of the best thing about our communication strategies because then they can actually hear me and the interpreter while they're cooking and taking care of their students. So we're, we're starting to do more of that. And as a result that we're gonna need more support. And I would like to see all side communication having that uh, media, multimedia component or even just um, podcasting or audios out there so parents can actually hear us speaking to them directly and potentially also have all ASL interpreter eventually of all of our public meetings, that would be my dream, so thank you. That's fantastic, thank you so much. How about you, Bradley? You know, thank you, uh, President Ford, members of the board, Superintendent Maldonado, uh, Cabinet, my fellow colleagues, Principals Glazer and, and Fresh, and of course, community members present tonight. I'm gonna echo uh, definitely what Kip said. Um, what was really a highlight, I think, for, for me, especially as a new principal and new to this community, is really um, uh, engaging with our, uh, with our families through focus groups uh, that were coordinated and facilitated with Maria Lario Sorton through the CSI process and the parent engagement and language access units. Um, it was just, uh, it was very valuable data uh, to really hear their perspectives. And I think an overarching theme, um, as is common at most schools, is just uh, trust. Uh, really continuing to build trust with our families and, and, and viewing them as partners and the importance of building that trust and, and just working in, in close partnership. So uh, I look forward to, uh, to continuing to, to listen to uh, the parent community and build out that work. I've, I've formed a parent advisory council uh, and uh, we just met this evening and, and I'm, I'm, I'm really inspired by the focus group uh, work and I've formed my own focus group of, uh, of parents that are representing representative from different feeders that feed into La Cumbra, uh, the representative of, uh, of different uh, student uh, demographics. We have a parent of an EML uh, student, a parent of a uh, student with IEPs. Uh, we also have uh, parents representative of our core knowledge program and our general, uh, general education population. So the entire spectrum and, uh, and uh, we meet twice monthly and I'm continuing to, to just learn and listen and, uh, and work to build that trust. So thank you, Maria, and, and thank you, uh, uh, Language Access Unit and, uh, and of course, Parent Engagement Unit uh, folks. They've been amazing. Thank you. Terrific, Bradley, thank you. And Kelly. I think in addition to highlighting, as I already did, the um, increase in the parent involvement at meetings, um, I would say that one of the things I'm most proud of is our parent participation in FIDA, which actually took place last January before our school closures and uh, multiple PTA board members um, are, are Multiple parents are PTA board members this year who participated in that program. So they've been able to continue with the work and the, the goals that we established, which increasing parent communication in the home language was um, a priority in addition to being more culturally aware and sensitive. And so they write articles for the principal's message and the PTA message. And I just think that, that being able to continue to focus on what parents established as priorities last year is something that we're all proud of. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Larios Horton, any last comments? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify too that uh, uh, Ms. Fresh was mentioning the FIDA um, and what it stands for is Families for Inclusion, Diversity and Access. And it is a focus group that was held at Adams last spring through pandemic. And I have to say it was probably one of the most um, effective and valuable uh, focus groups that we've ever led. So um, congratulations to the Adams team. It was a team effort. So it is an example of um, a promising practice, I would say, in our district with regard to family engagement. So I just want to make that clarification and we'll, we'll bring this back again on consent uh, on the February 9th meeting. Perfect. Thank you so much. And for... Uh, 
The final agenda item number five, um, Ms. Maldonado, what are we thinking? Board President, I would like to pull this uh, item and bring it back on the next meeting so we can give it its due attention. It is a very important topic and I know we've heard tonight from some of our speakers that it's uh, late at night, bringing some of these very important topics uh, sort of doesn't give it its uh, central area of focus. I do recognize, I believe we may have one public speaker, so I'd like to apologize to the public speaker and would like to ask your permission to maybe let the public speaker comment, but also uh, apologize that we're pulling it at the last minute. Well, I think I think that's important. Uh, I would like, it, it is Moni DeWitt, if she is available for her comment. I do want to reinforce that the board has really looked at this and I think it's a great report and I think it, it does deserve at least more time and attention. But Ms. Trujillo, do you have Ms. DeWitt on the phone? Yes, President Ford, she is online and I will ask her to speak. Thank you. Moni DeWitt? Yes, thank you, President Ford and uh, all you weary-eyed board members. And um, I am at home uh, versus my studio, so I apologize if um, it breaks up here. But uh, yeah, I'm happy to postpone to next week, but um, just as a final closing night, um, you know, I would really appreciate a relationship with any one of you. And actually the family engagement person and um, some administrative staff have actually been a little hostile to me. I'm ready to move on, forgive. Because frankly, I have insights all along your equity issues that um, team up with literacy. If you did any research on literacy and incarceration, if you looked at even Black Lives Matter and what pisses them off, uh, what upsets them about the police, and um, you would find that there is an undercurrent about literacy that gets people stuck. I've discovered this and I want to share this and our district is not following best practices. That's fine. You know, uh, so much of the country isn't, but you know, we're like down at 48% or whatever the heck it is, California, we shouldn't be down the slow. Santa Barbara shouldn't be down the slow. We're the have and the have nots. Um, people of means get their kids okay. I am one that was quasi of means. I use my house as a credit card. And my, my son, who's dyslexic, which he got from me, um, is doing fine. And he's actually now in your district. Please don't discriminate against him because of me. And, um, you know, I just want to say I have a lot of insights that none of you have lived and I want you to honestly know that I'm actually on your side, but uh, in some ways I'm ahead of you. You know, neurodiversity is nowhere. You don't have dyslexics on your freaking thing for special ed. I'm Call thank people you. disabled instead of learning differences. Need I go on? Could somebody call me? Could somebody care? Thank I'd appreciate you. it. Thank I'm you. President, for that concludes public comment. Thank you very much for all your help this evening, Mr. Hio. And for the last uh, two items that we have tried to flush out and be more detailed about, I want to first of all thank Ms. Maldonado and Mr. Hio for working uh, on the calendar updates and also the updates on uh, future agenda items. So kind of combining both of them, board members or Ms. Maldonado, are there any items that you would like to add to this list as we go forward to make it even more complete. Ms. Ford. Go ahead. Uh, well, not necessarily add, I just, or maybe. <laughs> I see on the future agenda items that we have our study session in March. And um, I'm thinking to make our study session as efficient as possible, this coming weeks would be a good opportunity to gather information of what the board members want in this study session. So if I could uh, suggest Ms. Maldonado that perhaps you can send us a survey asking what do you want to see? And this way you and your team can start getting prepared for that. And also 
it would be good for us to start thinking of including in our schedules to have regular study sessions on student achievement uh, as we move forward and in, into the year. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any other board members that would like to add something? Mm, seeing none, I guess I would just say that uh, I totally agree with this idea about the board study session. And Ms. Maldonado, I'm wondering if you and I can also talk a little bit about just sort of setting up quarterly board study sessions about excellence in teaching and learning or something to that effect. Um, in any case, I, I really appreciate that we're having this and I know the community will appreciate that we're sort of forecasting what's coming up ahead. Uh, so our next meeting is on Tuesday, February 9th um, at 6.30, of course, with closed session ahead of time. It will be, again, remote virtual participation only. And I must say that over the past weeks, I have, um, I guess it's only been a week, I, I have been thinking a lot about Amanda Gorman's words and her sort of her mandate for us. And um, I want to remind our community to be safe and prepared and careful, not only because of COVID-19, but also as we anticipate a pretty bad storm in the next couple of days. Santa Barbara and Goleta sometimes have a rough time when it rains pretty hard. So be safe, be careful. And I would just close with some words from Amanda Go uh, Gorman. She said, let the globe if nothing else, say this is true, that even as we grieved, we grew, that even as we hurt, we hoped, that even as we tired, we tried. So we gotta keep at it. Thanks, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>